individual members but we will be able to comment on that once the minutes of that meeting have been released and i'm not sure when that'll be it'll be in the weeks or even possibly months ahead and at that time um all of that will be open for whatever public discussion people want to want to make about that um does anybody else on the board wish to make any com further comment I think I'd uh, like to comment. I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, <coughs> our board has worked very hard um, over a very long period of time to negotiate a new agreement with the town of Dennis. And um, uh, the terms of the agreement uh, require uh, significant additional contributions from the town of Dennis uh, to our school system. And uh, as I think was quoted in the newspaper today, uh, you know, 35% of the capital cost of the new school will be Dennis's responsibility. Um, their current student population uh, is about 30% of the district and is shrinking. And probably over the next uh, 20 years will shrink uh, to 25 percent, to maybe even less. Um, so, so there's a significant uh, um, additional burden that the town of Dennis is assuming under this agreement. And um, uh, there are other features of it that al allow for a smoothing of costs. Uh, as Dennis's uh, enrollment shrinks over the next few years, um, Yarmouth taxpayers will assume an, an ad additional burden. And um, the smoothing uh, features of this new agreement will slow that, uh, but not stop it. Uh, so uh, there will be responsibility for additional costs uh, on the part of Yarmouth taxpayers over the next few years, but there will be, as I said, significant additional contribution from the town of Dennis. And um, we're under the terms of the agreement, we'll have a uh, special town meeting in the fall, as will Dennis, uh, to vote on the agreement. And, um, uh, you know, it certainly would encourage, uh, at this time, encourage uh, Yarmouth taxpayers uh, to vote in favor of the agreement. Um, we believe it is a, a favorable resolu resolution of a longstanding um, uh, series of discussions with Dennis and um, uh, the school committee has made uh, um, a decision that, that they want to build a new school and and that's their decision uh, not ours uh, uh, and we, we're not uh, going to stand um, in the way of that decision so um, we're uh, pleased to have this behind us and to move forward so Okay, thank you. And by the way, the paperwork for the uh, stipulation um, of dismissal, which is the document to terminate the litigation, will be filed within seven days of today's date. It takes a little time to circulate it for signatures. There's three different counsel that have to sign off on it. Okay, we'll go to public comment. Would anybody like to be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, you can. Is that when, now, given that you're going yeah. to yes, okay. definitely. after I'll call on you shortly, and you can talk about the Center Street. That's why I wanted to give you a heads up on that. My name is Lois Greeby, and I'm Precinct One, and I just want to thank you. Thank you very much for putting this uh, behind us, and we can start with the new um, future between the two communities. And I know that it's been a very difficult decision for some of you. It's been very painful, it's hard. And I thank you for your courage to do it. I know it's not easy, but it is going to be the best for our community and for our next generation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Maria. Uh, good evening, my name is Maria Morasco, Pleasant Street. Um, I'm here to talk about the tornado and the debris cleanup. 
Um, uh, as you well know, my st uh, first of all, let me start with a big shout out of gratitude to Eversource and certainly to all of our town workers who did yeoman service on that day and then uh, to clean up much of the debris. But I'm here to ask for your consideration for those of us who still have many more trees to pick up and to get to the dump uh, that you might consider issuing a special pass um, for those of us who still need to get there. Um, I had over 10 trees, uh, stumps coming up. There's only so many hours in the day that you can cut. <laughs> uh, my chainsaw is actually getting a little bit of wear and tear. And so during the day, the, the car with the trailer hitch goes with me uh, to work every day. So I'm only available to get to the dump on the weekends. And you know that's a very slow conga line on the weekends. So, um, I think it's going to take at least another two months, um, and that's conservative uh, for me to actually get there and get the rest of my trees to the facility. So a special pass um, only for those who certify that they are dumping tornado debris would be very much appreciated. So um, again, thank you all. It's a pleasure to see you tonight. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jim Cullen, Precinct 1, and you know me because I've been here many times to be fairly critical of the process. So it would be disingenuous of me if I didn't come and say thank you. Um, your ability to compromise and be open-minded, I think, is a real tribute to all of you. Uh, secondly, as we get towards this public meeting, town hall meeting in the fall, anything that can be done to help with education sessions, even on the road at the senior center or the like, because you know better than anyone how complicated this is and how a dynamic situation it is. And there are a ton of hard feelings, I'm sure. But uh, we need to go forward, as you know better than I, and I congratulate you. And I may not be here for the DPW, and I was not harmed as this woman was, but I think uh, all of our town staff that worked following that now was two in Yarmouth, I guess, tornadoes, uh, did an unbelievable job, and the town was out there on Forest Road. I saw them this afternoon. So, and I'm sure people had to leave their families, the staff and the like, so uh, should be on the record. I'd like to be on the record for saying uh, thank you to the town staff and contractors that helped out because uh, obviously people were in tough shape and, and it's great to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Don Marino in District 1. I also would like to share the thank you. I know it was a difficult process, but we're there. I would like to urge the selectmen as well as the school committee now to concentrate on building a new school. Building a new school for this town is a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to do something that we haven't done in a long time. It would enhance the town, it would enhance the town's reputation. You have a lot of people in this town that have expertise in academia, in building classrooms, in building schools. Take advantage of that. I know you have architects. I know we have to work, not only the selectmen, but you have to work with Dennis. I mean, there's a lot of different groups involved. But, uh, but what I'm urging you to do is to make a priority of getting the best school that we can build with the money that we have. It's something that can we really be proud of, that we can really say, we did it. We, we have stuff in the school that makes us different, makes us special. I think everybody, everybody would welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Steve Berglund. I'm from Precinct 1. I'm a new resident to Yarmouth as of three years ago. I'm a grandfather of three grandchildren, and I can't thank you enough for your positive movement towards improving the infrastructure of our educational system here in the town. To neglect the children uh, of this community or any community in this country is putting at peril our quality of life, the future of our democracy, and the future of this country. So by realizing the need to take advantage of educating our most important natural resource, the minds of the young children, uh, and putting that forth in terms of putting a new school together that will promote that, 
I applaud you, thank you very, very much. Tom. Hi. Tom Sullivan, Precinct 1. Earlier today, I filed a lawsuit in Superior Court, challenging for the taxpayers here in the town of Yarmouth, the registered voters, challenging the school committee's decision to bypass town meeting. All right, and the December 4th vote. That's all I have to say on this. It's been filed in Superior Court, and I will not make any more further comments other than to a judge. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Carol Wall. I live in Precinct, Precinct One. Um, I too would like to thank you all very much for coming to the conclusion that you did this afternoon about school. And already uh, education has been mentioned. I would hope, uh, I've served by the way on the Capital Budget Committee, I think I served about 10 years. And I'm very, very fond of the town I live in and I want very much for this town to be more successful in terms of its economic development and its educational opportunities. And I would urge you in the future to, I know that it would, it takes more work and you're already very overburdened with a lot of detailed uh, stuff that you do, but I would urge you to hold forums um, with townspeople so that we can talk back and forth with you and not just make comments and not not hear from you, except when you're speaking by yourselves. I'd like to see these forums over the years. I know that there have been hard feelings between Dennis and Yarmouth for many, many years, and it feels as if this afternoon, perhaps, is a marking time, a marking place for us to move ahead into a, a, new, a new kind of relationship between the two towns. Our children go across the line, we all go across the line from town to town, and we all share the same space in this beautiful spot we live in. So let us move forward, and I hope very much that you will build on what you did this afternoon. Thank you. I just, I just have one um, extra comment. If you, Dan could send the DPW down my street one more time. My neighbors and I, and there were several of us, would really appreciate the piles that we have along the, st the street being um, picked up. So, thank you. Vita. Vita Morris, in view of uh, what was said earlier, I guess I uh, cannot ask the question that I wanted to ask, and that was to, uh, uh, of those uh, members of the board who voted uh, to uh, withdraw the uh, lawsuit, uh, I would like to know on what grounds they did that. Uh, but I guess I can do that, uh, in view of what was said We've earlier. Been advised, Vita, the, the lawsuit, the lawsuit, the agreement <laughs> requires um, the various boards to work cooperatively to effectuate that agreement and um, we've been cautioned not to delve into um, the specifics of what happened in that session until after those minutes are released. Um, once That's they are released then there won't be any real um, need to um, not discuss those things. If the particular board members wish to, then they would be free to at that point. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I'm especially surprised in view of uh, the vote that the town meeting in Dennis took uh, last night, um, uh, putting off indefinitely consideration of using uh, the foundation enrollment. Uh, for arriving at assessments. I mean, I, that, that means, you know, anything can happen, and, and we won't even have the right say, uh, or, or a say in, in that. Uh, as for um, people who uh, Im at least imply that somehow the children will learn better in a brand new building, 
Uh, I repeat something that I said in a letter uh, to the Cape Cod Times a little while ago. Unless the school walls preternaturally pre start teaching, that's not going to happen. Not with this administration and not with the teachers that have been assembled and uh, where the district is now mired in level three for at least five years. I think it's running more than that now. So I think that's not going to happen. Mr. Chairman, can I just address one point that you sure. made? I think it's, um, it's a little unfair to say that the people of Dennis didn't pass uh, that article last night. They were advised by the school committee to indefinitely postpone that article. And there was an explanation as to why. The explanation had to do with the fact that they had just signed the Memorandum of Understanding and that it was um, trying to, um, it was one of the pieces that they needed to do to move that forward and for the lawsuit to be dropped and for um, the school to be built. And there was a huge round of applause from Dennis. So it's not like Dennis didn't vote to support, they were all there, I think, to support that article. Um, it wasn't until they were there that they found out that they, it was asked by the school committee for it to be indefinitely postponed. So I, I just don't think it's fair to characterize the town of Dennis in that way. Well, but but uh, that that's how they voted. I mean, let's face they it. They voted to support the recommendation by both the Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, and the School Committee. And by the, by the way, we are we are back to to uh, where uh, the superintendent started with using uh, the uh, election uh, the um, district wide vote. Uh, uh, and discarding the uh, uh, what was in the uh, uh, and is still in the uh, current uh, district agreement, uh, going to the two town uh, votes, uh, uh, and uh, that was because the superintendent obviously thought that she could do better by going uh, district wide than going to uh, especially with Dennis uh, uh, to uh, to achieve uh, her end. Now she's back at it again with the. Uh, uh, Aside, the, the new assessments that were presented to the school committee last night, which uh, did away with uh, the school committee had voted on July 15 to present to Dennis um, of the, uh, the town meeting uh, a, um, an assessment based on uh, uh, foundation enrollment, which would have required Dennis to pay $311,000 more than they had already done. And so what does the superintendent do? She uh, fiddles around with the budget and comes up with uh, a totally no, a new assessment formula based on the existing agreement so that Dennis is not liable for anything more than th they've already paid. Can Anyone I just else? Uh, no, let's, let's, let's. I think you've responded uh, appropriately. So anyone else? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, tornado updates and debris removal. The, the woman oh, the was there a lady from Center Street? Where are you? Oh, right there. I, I didn't know if you wanted me to, to wait on that one. No, no, no. Okay. Um, thank you. My name is Ruth Holland. Um, I live right in the midst of Center Street. And I wanted to just be able to say a few things um, before your discussion comes up. Um, I've had nine years there um, at my location to observe the extent of the problem, which really is, is, is severe. We've got heavy, heavy traffic on that road because we are the direct entry down to Grays Beach, which is all of, as all of you know, is a major public attraction. The traffic seems to get heavier yearly. Summer is always worse than winter, but summer it is a heavily trafficked road. And we've got service vehicles and cars, of course, and motorcycles and all kinds of vehicles traveling frequently at super high speeds. Um, my house is right up sort of close to the road, so because I'm home this summer, I, I can see it very clearly. Um, I think that the problem has been entrenched for so long because we've really done very little. Um, and it's sort of now a known phenomenon that if you, want, if you like to speed, Center Street is a wonderful straightaway right down to the beach and you can just open up the throttle and fly. And that's what people do. Um, 
we've got teenagers at night, um, so it's not just a daytime phenomenon. We've got them at night, and I'm talking two, three in the morning, um, flying down the street. Um, we have very few um, speed limit signs. I know there have been different approaches in the past, but I think it's going to take a combination um, of tools from the toolbox to fix this. Um, and I hope that we do that rather than figure and take an option that's really something that just accommodates the problem, such as sidewalks, which I think you have all, I think you have all decided against. That's, that's a Band-Aid to try and accommodate a problem. I'd I, I hope that we'll come to some agreement of how to fix the actual problem. We have very, very minimal police presence there. I know that was discussed before and we were hopeful. Very minimal. Um, so there are no repercussions for speeding. Um, so I'm going to th throw out more, sp more speed limit signs, maybe the flashing monitor that tells you what your speed is as you go down the road, speed bumps that can be moved in and out, um, more police presence is huge, and maybe even considering you have double fine if you're caught speeding on this road. It's not just the neighborhood, although I think I can speak for the neighborhood by saying nobody's happy about what's happening, but you're talking about a lot of people that are coming down to a beach. You've got children traveling in the cars, families, et cetera. It's, it is a major problem, so I'm, I look forward to hearing what you're going to discuss today. Thank you. Okay, next item, tornado updates and debris removal. Um, just a few preliminary comments and then I uh, will move to the individual members on this. Um, the day after the tornado, there was a meeting in Harwich where Governor Baker was there with various other people from the um, county emergency response team, representatives from various boards of selectmen, town administrators, police chiefs, fire chiefs, and so forth. And um, he, he received commentary from, from all of these people. And at the end of that session, summarized what he felt was being expressed to him as um, what these people told him the community needs were. Um, Obviously, debris removal, access to down lines, make roads passable, um, and get this stuff done quickly because of the tourist season and the limited amount of time the businesses have to make to make their money. I, I was at the meeting. Tracy was there. Dan was there. Um, Chief Fredrickson was there. Chief Simonian was there. I, I think Jeff was there as well. Um, and the governor responded very quickly in the next within 24 hours we had all kinds of equipment and, and personnel that were dispatched to Yarmouth from various um, various state agencies including the, <clears throat> the Department of Corrections and um, um, Ultimately, the National Guard, I think 500 guardsmen were, were, uh, were dispatched to the Cape area. So the response was very, very quick and um, very much needed, and, and uh, we, we, we very much appreciated the governor's um, quick, um, well, his immediate availability to us and his quick response to the needs of this community. The very next day, he was also doing a, um, a tour of, of Yarmouth, stopped at the police station, the DPW facility, and then we went down to an area in, the, sp in the, um, the vicinity of Springer Lane in West Yarmouth to see the damage there, and I, I can tell you that I was amazed at the, the, the degree of devastation that there was. It was unlike any other area of Yarmouth that, that I saw. I couldn't believe that that people survived, that there was no major injuries or no loss of life. It was it was something to see. It really was. It was, you know, I thought that 
the damage was kind of uniform as I drove around town, but this, this was a disaster area. And um, <clears throat> so we, we, we did get to see that up close and personal, and, and um, talk, the governor talked to the people, he talked to the workers. Um, he was very accommodating to them and very, uh, you know, I, I think he lent a lot of assurance to those people that, you know, the full, um, full resources of the state were going to be available to the town of Yarmouth, and so we're very grateful for that. So before I go further, Tracy, do you want to make any comments about those meetings? Uh, the only other point that I want to make is that the Undersecretary for Homeland Security, her name was Jean Benincasa Thorpe, she was a total rock star. Um, she just was amazing, and um, I agree with your uh, wrap-up that we were very, very, very lucky that nobody lost their life. But um, extremely impressed with the response at the state level, and um, not only thanking our first responders, our police, our fire. Um, Chief was lucky enough to have to be stuck with me for a few hours and drive me around. Um, and our DPW workers, but uh, Dan. Dan worked tirelessly coordinating uh, for our residents, uh, keeping ev keeping us up to date, keeping everybody up to date, trying to stay current with social media. And um, also we had the, the um, storm, the uh, emergency shelter was open. It was not utilized to the extent that I think that they thought it might have been. We were very fortunate that the heat wasn't um, as extreme on those days because I think without electricity we would have um, probably seen the shelter be more utilized but um, I was extremely impressed by the response but I, I, I think that our board should said a thank you to Miss Thorpe I know Dan you worked with her at at, at length she was uh, very involved and very um, available to us and uh, the state resources from what I understand were here through Sunday and I'm sure Dan has more to add to that. I think we should send a letter of thanks also to Governor Baker yes. as well. Um, Karen, no, and Karen, the lieutenant and Karen governor Polito, was who was down here the day before when the governor was out of uh, state, we should we should acknowledge Karen too. Um, and our own our own um, DPW. Everybody has worked tirelessly in this cleanup. Uh, Process. I was talking to Dan about it, and he, I'm going to have him comment um, in short order. But we we're talking about the um, contractors that they hired to process all of this um, debris that was being brought to the landfill. So I went down to see what was, what was involved in it Saturday, and. Um, it's a remarkable operation that, that they have. They, I forget the piece of equipment Eric would know being in his bit, the, the one Top with grinder. the big Top shovel grinder. Uh, Top grinder. Um, that picks up the debris. It puts it on a, um, like this little escalator ramp, and then it's dumped into this big vat, ground up and spit out I mean, instantly into this big pile of emulsion. Uh, um, <laughs> and then there's a and then there's a front end loader that takes it and, and makes these humongous piles. It's, it's like if you walk in the desert and you see the pyramids. That's what it looks like in there with all the stuff that's coming out of these machines. And they're, while they're doing this, people are coming in 10, 12, 15 cars at a time, trucks dumping stuff, and they keep right up with it. It's it's remarkable. And Dan tells me that. I think it was since what the day after the hurricane that they were hired, and it's like forty-five hundred bucks a day, yeah, roughly. Yeah, but they're worth it. I mean, you would not believe the way they can process this stuff. I was, I was just amazed um, watching them do it. So, Dan, you want to comment on starting with um, the first meeting up? And I understand that after that there was a meeting with the federal yes. delegation yep. that you attended. Yep. So on Friday there was a meeting in Harwich uh, with. Uh, Senator Markey, it was called by uh, Speaker of the House DeLeo, and uh, also uh, Congressman Keating was there. And um, one of the significant messages by the audience was the uh, impact to the tourist economy and the um, 
there was quite a few asks associated with that. And one of the big ones was that um, we needed to get uh, some assistance from the state to bring in a, a marketing campaign such that people can appreciate the fact that the Cape is open for business. And today it was announced by the Lieutenant Governor here in Yarmouth that $100,000 will be made available to the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce to begin that effort to uh, inform uh, all our seasonal visitors that, yes, indeed, the Cape is open for business. Additionally, the uh, delegation heard a lot of commentary associated with small businesses that had refrigerators and freezers filled with food stocks and whatnot and lost uh, lost income because folks uh, you had their power out, they couldn't get to their establishment. So also announced today was a establishment of a, of a loan fund uh, up to $50,000 per loan uh, to be paid out over uh, three years first month no payment on a 3% note. So uh, that goes into effect. Actually, uh, the website is active now. Uh, businesses could apply immediately for that uh, relief. And I anticipate uh, down the line as more time goes on and they have some opportunity to synthesize some of these requests that there'll be other similar style assistance offered to the uh, towns that were impacted by the, uh, by the tornadoes. So it was a very quick and timely response uh, by our government officials for sure. There was also along those same lines some discussion when we had that first meeting with the governor about um, qualifying potentially for some federal disaster relief funds and there's certain thresholds I guess that you have to meet in terms of total dollar loss. Some, some of that dollar loss would be reflected in um, like additional costs that we just mentioned to the landfill overtime for DPW workers, police, fire, and I, I think that that the number is just shy of ten million. Yeah, about nine and a half million dollars. Six mil yeah. or something like that. But Mark's familiar with um, with that federal process. We've we've had um, a few conversations about that. So Mark, do you want to comment on 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 that? Yeah, I think one of the things that, um, first of all, I would, I, I would echo the comments of uh, the other members of the board regarding the superb response from the town, uh, that all town staff and departments, as well as from the state. Uh, my little neighborhood, Indian Memorial Drive, was devastated by the storm. We have a lot of trees uh, that are down, and quite frankly, um, there's still a lot of debris, as was mentioned before. So one of the things that I'm hopeful for is that if indeed we do qualify for federal assistance, we may be able to actually do more for local residents. So this is something that uh, I've, I've certainly uh, suggested that we try to do is in other instances where tornadoes have touched down and in those areas where there has been relief provided, some of that money has been used to help with residents and their costs in terms of the debris removal. So um, these rules and guidelines do change from time to time. So my hope though is that should we qualify, we might be able to do more uh, for the residents of Yarmouth. Uh, I've made that request, I've sort of raised it, and uh, hopefully we can get some decision on this, uh, this, desi this federal disaster aid de declaration soon. Um, I would also agree with the other comments. The more we can do at the landfill, I know the, they're working overtime, big time over there, uh, but the more we can do to keep the landfill open and the disposal area open for residents would be obviously, I know, appreciated by a lot of people. Um, there are folks that do have, I mean, there are folks that have the means to take care of debris, but there are lots of people that don't have the means, and there's a significant amount of debris piling up, I've seen, in, in, in a number of uh, yards and a number of properties. So, like I said, hopefully we do qualify for that, and hopefully we can help folks out a little bit more in terms of dealing with this very, very serious problem. So, thanks, Mike. Norm or Eric, do you have any comments? Eric, uh, <coughs> just, just out of curiosity, um, you know, what is the plan moving forward? Um, assuming there is assistance, assuming that there may not be any assistance, you know, is, is the town going to take it upon itself to extend landfill hours, or as as we talked about briefly, perhaps curbside pickup? I mean, what what's the plan going forward in the two scenarios, with assistance and without? So typically we're in the phase of a cleanup that um, initially the government resource, the state and municipal are supposed to be allocated on public lands only. So now as it, some of the speakers had mentioned and Select Mentality talked about, we're in this phase now that it's a policy decision for us. So um, 
right now I would say that we, we decided be based on the volume of uh, transactions that were going on at the transfer station and consistent with what, what some of the other towns, Dennis and Harwich specifically, had as a policy related to keeping their station open, no charge, till uh, close of business on Saturday. We went with that, and I was going to ask for your permission to memorialize that this evening. But further, the question would be, um, as a policy, do we want to continue with that uh, for some period of time that we can discuss. And then secondly, the next step of this would be if we tell the public that um, if you can get your debris to the curbside, it'll be available for public resources to pick up. That will add weeks to the cleanup activity, having been through this before the town has done this in a similar fashion before. And it's likely that uh, many folks in town will not have any means to get their debris up to a processing facility, couple that with an insurance situation, which if the tree didn't fall on your house or your car, and it's in your yard, and it costs thousands of dollars to do something with it, yeah. um, that's all on you. The other challenge, and we're, we're working a little bit with this now, is is we can't send the public resource onto a private property. However, there is an organization in town right now that has been given some names of some uh, residents that we've kept track of that are uh, in great need uh, based on uh, either they were uh, uh, had uh, medical conditions or other issues associated with that team rubicon is an organization on the private side that's working with us to identify those property owners they can go onto the site move the material to the curbside we can pick it up but moving forward than that typically in this response we're going to i know the ro rotary had a team of folks established on monday to go into the neighborhood we're going to need more citizen-related activities and, and organizations to help those people that can't help themselves. But the policy for us to consider would be one uh, related to how long do we want to keep the transfer station open under these present conditions, and two, do we want to make an announcement such that people could bring their material to the curbside and will, for a period of time into the future, collect that unto a date certain so those are the two questions all right i have some preliminary comments on that um the first thing is this is this has been a terrible terrible disaster to the to the community and something that you don't see every day it's unprecedented i think it's been over 50 years since we've we've had this kind of um the tornado actually and uh, the the only thing i've lived through that is on the Cape that this is reminiscent of was Hurricane Bob. There was debris all over the place, and it seems probably still some left. It seemed like it was never-ending. So because of the, the, the situation that people are found, the cost of this, the fact that we have an elderly population that, that can't move um, this stuff, I, I would be in favor of a very, very liberal policy in terms of going forward to leaving the landfill open to dispose of, of debris. But uh, along those same lines, I, I had another question that, that I think relates to that, and that is how I, I see crews out there, for example, today at the corner of um, I think it was Old Main Street and Wood Road. The, the road was actually blocked off by the police. And on that corner, there's like incredible damage to trees. It's, it got hit hard, real bad. And I've been driving by that ever since the tornado. But today, they actually shut the road off, and they had crews that were moving that stuff out of there um, on the corner. And uh, I, I don't know who they were, whether they were state personnel or, or local um, DPW people. But every now and then when you drive by you see these little pockets of near the curbside you have a lot of debris and, and I guess my question maybe Jeff could help me with this is other than people calling in and reporting that stuff do you have any way of systematically tracking these areas and going down these streets to help people clear that stuff out of there I think Maria has given you a, 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 a place where you can start <laughs> In other words, is there any systematic way that, that DPW workers are, are, are going down? I mean, you, you go down, for example, Long Pond Drive, and it, it looks fine, and then all of a sudden you see an area where there's debris on both sides of the road, 
it seems to be like more in pockets now and and i was wondering if there's a way that you you are identifying that or systematically going through these areas yeah that's a great question uh, jeff colby public works director uh, and kind of uh, prelude to answering that question, there's going to be many, many weeks of cleanup out there. Uh, it, there's, there's a lot more to do. Um, I'd say the, the big heavy stuff in opening up roads has been uh, completed, but the, the cleanup of the, the shoulders, the public properties, uh, that's going to be many, many weeks uh, to come. Uh, as the board mentioned, um, the, the state resources were, were much appreciated. That was very helpful. Uh, DCR presence from DOT, Department of Corrections, as was mentioned before, uh, all very helpful agencies, but that support stopped on Sunday. And so now we're on our own. Uh, there is an effort underway to try to organize some uh, municipal support. There continues to be some interest among some communities to help us out. And so we'll continue to try to leverage some of those to help uh, speed up the cleanup and, and recovery, if you will. Uh, but I certainly wanted to emphasize that there's, there's a long ways to go. We have a lot more to do. Uh, encourage people, to, if they um, if they'd like to call the, the DPW, we're certainly keeping long lists and track of all of that. Uh, our systematic approach to answer your question uh, is we've started looking at the snowplow routes. We've broken up the town into our snowplow routes, and we started to go route by route clearing those areas. So we'll go down every road in those routes and start to clear those. We've only just begun that process, though, once the roads were opened up and cleared. So, again, that'll be a very, very lengthy process for us to complete all of the snowplow routes, and some of those routes are much more devastated than other areas. So on those snowplow routes, if anything's at the curb or very close to the curb, you guys are going to take that away? That's correct. So we're clearing the right of way under uh, the current policies. If the board uh, determines something else, we'll certainly follow that. But the current current policy and practice is to clear the right of way, everything along the shoulder of all those roads. Okay. So people should get, if they have trees or debris in their yard, they should try to get it to the edge of the road. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, the policy that we put out there is we're clearing storm debris. It's in the public right-of-way. We have not put out any kind of notice encouraging people to drag it to the road. If that's going to be something the, the board would support, that's a, a change of the current uh, policy announcement that we have posted on the town website. Uh, we could certainly become easily overloaded. It's, we're still trying to get a handle on how long this process is going to take of cleanup, okay. and we're currently just cleaning the public right-of-way and public property. So it's kind of like an abandoned car. If it's on your property, nobody would do anything about it. But if it's found in the middle of the road, the town will take care of it. <laughs> Something like that. We're clearing the public right of way, yes. I get it. Can I just ask him one question? I have an, uh, a concern about um, uh, tree companies scamming some of our elderly people. And I'm wondering what information we can put out or is there a way to coordinate a I mean I know I know for liability it's hard to recommend certain companies but um, I'm really afraid of the gouging that could take place with some of our people and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that and how we can manage that to some extent is there somebody at the senior center that can help perhaps them look at something and see what's potentially fair in terms of a proposal or Usually on consumer protection, we would we would give them information to contact the attorney general's office. I mean, that's kind of a slippery slope for us to to get into that situation, other than just to advocate for what the normal public protective agencies are that are out there. You know, it seems to me if we if we're going going down the quote unquote road of of uh, asking people or saying to people that they can bring debris from their property out to roadside. Um, we ought to do that consistently. Uh, we shouldn't just say, oh, well, you know, and, and kind of look the other way. I think we ought to have a program to do that so that everybody has the same opportunity uh, in the town uh, as everyone else. And, and uh, you know, I don't think that it would be appropriate to have people feel like they were left out of the, um, uh, the process. So, you know, if we're going to, we're going to uh, um, encourage people to bring things to the, to the side of the road or within to the right of way, we ought to announce that somehow uh, on our uh, phone announcement system. Well, and one thing I'd like to do to, to that point, if that is the desire of the board, what we can do is spend the next 
a uh, couple of weeks still working on the public way aspect of this situation and then mm -hmm. we'll present some plan that if that's the will of the board to consider that I would I would identify maybe a certain period of weeks in the upcoming month maybe outside the tourist season I don't know would up be up for debate that we would give based on the snowplow routes if you live in those areas this is the time in which the town resources would be applied there we could publish a calendar on that we could manage that because one of the things we are going to lose is the tub grinder those are an extremely short supply in yeah. Harwich and Dennis are dying for that so what we don't want to do and we don't have the drive in site to to assemble material anymore right so just get rid of yeah, it yeah <laughs> so uh, so what we could do is let's give if we could give us some time to present to you by August 13th a plan what that would look like if that so is the desire of the board that um, you'd like to address that in a more liberal fashion I we think certainly you would have do that because otherwise yeah. you know the people are going to be putting it out there it's going to stay there it could yep. be a hazard right. in, in yeah. another right. way and you can't have them going around and around and oh, around every correct. day because they have their yep. own work to do it Absolutely. cost a fortune that so sounds I think, like a good plan I think if we had a date that would be helpful does that work for you Jeff but I don't think we should it have does. any uh, hard and fast cutoff points I mean there's there's too many people that are affected as Jeff said there's too much debris that still remains out there it's just going to be a long process to get rid of it all so the other question I'd have for you then tonight then what, how would you want to address the uh, ongoing waiver of the fee in uh, for the uh, transfer station do you want to continue that policy until we meet again on the 13th I would say uh, at I minimum. would definitely say yes yeah but I would ask the what do you yeah, I agree. Yeah. How we long? need a motion to that effect. Yeah, so that would, that would be helpful. How long Absolutely. do you have the tub grinder for? Because once that goes, it's going to be... Once it goes, it'll be a hard time so to get how, it back. How long do you think that it's... I mean, you have to weigh the balance of how much is coming in based on that, so... What do you have? That's your Sunday? Right, right now, Saturday? we're looking through the weekend, but at $4,500 a day, that, that quickly adds up. So just to keep in mind, there's a cost associated with all of this. Right. But, of uh, yeah. it, it does grow, and if as the material starts to diminish in volume, you know, the benefit of keeping that on site is... Do you have a recommendation as, well. as to, in the short term, how long we should keep that in place? I would say through the weekend, which is the, the current policy. Beyond that, I don't think we'll be getting the volumes of material that'll keep that productive. One of uh, the that things could change if we yeah. go to you know pick up or well, do I mean, something we different. We could still but continue to take it yeah. without the grinder there. We'd have to That's find correct. another. Uh, but one, well, one of the things we could do, because it's destined to go to an, another one of the two communities that have a lot of capacity to take on space, we could work out a scenario where we could truck to those locations sure. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be a... We're trying to get a hold of more 10-wheel dump trucks and whatnot, but if we couldn't get one and we were a little bit pinched for space up there, we certainly, then our neighbors are going to be in need of that tub grinder for, for months probably. So it would be stationed geographically in close proximity to us anyways. Well, I think the weekend is not enough time. So I think that we should have it at least uh, till our next meeting, and then we can, we can get another update to see how you know what the volume is I, I assume you're keeping track of all the um, either the loads or the expense to the town to so that we can quantify it for uh, possible federal reimbursement you know, we're keeping track of the loads as well as obviously the expense when we weigh the material and the time that it's taking to uh, to grind and have that uh, day by day rental if you will uh, the amount that comes in by the residents is not something that's reimbursable or we've told at this point it's not going to be considered reimbursable Outside of the um, that expense, have you had much of an overtime budget with within your department for for purposes of clearing up the roads and the debris and so forth? Yeah, generally that was through the weekend. We supported the state resources that were in town, and we worked around the clock at the beginning of the storm, the beginning of the event, and then worked to, you know to eight o'clock each evening last week. So there was a significant overtime. The, Highway budget has been exceeded, uh, certainly, for their overtime for the year. Um, our expenses, and I, I shared this with Dan uh, earlier, through the weekend were about $50,000 uh, for storm cleanup at, at this point. Not for overtime, but all expenses, contractor support, the tub grinder, yeah. that type of thing. We've been compiling those days. Undersecretary asked for a report about every two days on the costs. I mean, one of the things that uh, we're all facing, all the towns, is that you know, the, the dollar value is driven really quickly. So one of the things that we're trying to do, in, in depending upon how the uh, de declaration goes, uh, potentially even asking the uh, legislative delegation to put a supplemental ask into the budget to give us an injection of cash to, to get us through. You know, one thing I am mindful of is all the private 
energy or all the energy that goes into picking up private materials, private resident materials, right now I cannot guarantee there'd be any reimbursement. That would be something we'd have to talk to the delegation about. So if that sum comes up to three hundred thousand dollars, say, which might not be that hard of a number to believe it could, right. um, we would have to have special legislation crafted to, to, to make us whole on that. So th these are all things that go into, you know, uh, recovery on this. And is, this is not something that the state hasn't heard about before. It's uh, It's been troublesome to me to think that, you know, my first event interacting with the state at this level was in 2011 with a tornado, and they still don't have a good plan to solve this dilemma with private property homeowners. And yeah. the reality is the only entity that can do really what we're asking to do is the government. And yet the, the legislation hasn't been generated to just uh, to provide an easy pathway for cities and towns. So that that's why we've had to say we can't do this right now until we get a local decision by the board as to what you want to do. I'd like to offer a motion <coughs> that we extend the exemption uh, uh, through uh, the next seven days and give Dan the uh, uh, authority to extend it another week to to our meeting on August 13th uh, as needed. Why don't we just extend it through August 13th? Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I think I think stuff uh, isn't going to go away between uh, now and August 13th. Well, if we can, uh, you know, encourage people to get it in sooner rather than later, I think would be that's the uh, uh, idea rather than delaying until the 13th and. Um, Um, does anyone have a motion to extend it through August 13th? So I'll move that. We have a second. I'll second it. Um, so this is for keeping the landfill open, right? For to receive Rush mm -hmm. and no, no the brief from the, the storm right. through the, the 13th to the residents. And property owners in, in Yarmouth, right? Residents and property mm -hmm. owners. Okay. So we have a motion, second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Two other things, though, Mr. Chairman. I think the community groups that Dan mentioned is a is a worthy cause. We're going to have some people that really are going to need help that aren't able to do it themselves. So, if there are groups out there that are willing, how do they contact the town and make themselves avail themselves yeah. to you? So right now we have uh, Kyle Pettuccini has been uh, reallocated as a town staffer to coordinate our effort between uh, multi-town mutual aid because that's kind of fallen onto Yarmouth's lap as well. Uh, now that the state uh, has deactivated. Um, but Kyle's compiling all the information that comes in to different departments that might get a phone call from folks. And in the coming days, I'll meet with uh, particularly Pat Armstrong and some other folks in town to talk about um, what kind of service groups we can tap to uh, supersize that effort, sure. And I'd really like the town to consider some way of helping uh, people look at those proposals somehow I know liability I don't know if we want to get into it but it would be nice that they had some comfort level that they're not being taken now one of the things perhaps like with the tax program they have there's uh, maybe a, a wise resident that could they could be diverted to to give some Tracy you mentioned and I and I don't want to speak for you um, that you were contemplating a motion to keep the um, tub grinder in place as well? No, I, I You weren't? No. Okay. No, I think that's completely up to them. I think that based on the n um, number of brushes coming in, I, I think to, to Norm's point, though, his point is a good one. I think, you know, the more, the faster that, the way, the way that they're doing it is an amazing operation, and they're able to do it very cost effectively without having to move it multiple times. Mm. Once that's gone, we're going to have to truck it, move it, um, okay. So I think that to say to the citizens to get it there as expeditiously as they can is good. But to Maria's point, there's a lot of people that are working and are only available to do that on the weekend. So, and I, but but that's completely up to however Jeff wants to handle it. I think is okay. Jeff, how are we going to get rid of those piles that after they come out of the the grinder, um, the the wood chips and um, sawdust and whatever? How are we going to get rid of that stuff? That's a great question as well. Uh, we had early indications that the 
company that's grinding it would take that, and they will, but the cost is fairly significant, so there's a cost of disposal that's still going to come along with this project as well. Is there any landscape companies that would be interested in that stuff? We're continuing to look at all the options. We've just I started to, to golf course you know, feel that out. Golf course. Both golf courses. Uh, they typically use a lot of mulch type material. Wood chips, really. Yeah. Wood chips. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at all the options. At yeah. this point, we don't have a great one, but we're continuing to look. <coughs> okay. And Mr. Chair, the other thing I wanted to, to add as far as comments the board had uh, indicated before, uh, appreciation of the state resources. I do want to mention that the towns of Sandwich and Mashpee also supported the effort with sending some equipment our way during the storm event as well. So that should be Thank you for not mentioning forgotten. that. The, the newspaper mentioned other towns were assisting, but it didn't identify who they were. So it was Mashpee and Sandwich? For us, yes. Yeah. Okay. There were other towns that helped some other communities. Yeah. There's presently a number of towns, including Medway, that has sent the crew into... Dennis Truro has been very helpful, as as East Ham, we're, we're enlisting the so not a bad place to say. Oh, no. <laughs> Bar Barnstable as well, you know. So we're we're putting into uh, a lot of effort into you know one of the challenges that I'm learning in uh, is because of that. There's some of the towns have indicated to us or the cities off Cape, although Newton's going to send us some equipment I think uh, starting soon. Is that it's, they've been having a, a hard time rounding up crews that want to take some time off to work like uh, really hard down here they you know it's be one thing if we offered them a couple days of R&R &R at the beach but uh, not so much to clean brush I guess you know but we'll get through that okay thank you Last Friday uh, at the Senior Center, uh, uh, the uh, acting director, I guess, was standing by the door and asking everybody entering whether they needed any help with uh, any kind of uh, damage or, or okay. debris or something. So um, uh, maybe you, uh, if you want to continue that, maybe you're, uh, yeah, see if you can uh, do that are. again. But yep. that's Thank you. That's good information. We were asked to compile quickly a list of folks in great need because of that Team Rubicon. They had done an assessment of Harwich and uh, Dennis and Yarmouth, and they wrapped up in Harwich kind of quick. So now they're spending this week, I believe, in uh, Yarmouth. So we needed to get some addresses to them. Chief, did you want to make some comments? Very quickly. Um, sometimes the top never gets kudos. Dan, fantastic job managing this. There's a lot more to do. so. Don't, Thank you. don't take too much of a rest. And Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> same to you. Uh, this is much different. We, you know, in policing, we're used to doing all types of things that aren't normal. Um, this has not been normal. Their response has been outstanding. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, just I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to recognize every employee of the town of Yarmouth, uh, it, absolutely phenomenal. From the moments after the event, our, our dispatch center, Frank, received a couple hundred calls. We're doing duty for Dennis because Dennis went down. The crews hit the street. I mean, every resource we have was enlisted. What was amazing to me in the moments afterwards, town hall was open for business. And if you lived in a part of town that didn't have the storm, you would have never known what we were dealing with. And as the days unwound and those crews stayed out on the street, we had an extra ask on Friday night to put teams together for the weekend because all the state resources were going to stay. And we, we were able to generate teams for the weekend. And that is a testament to the men and women that work for this town and the taxpayers that uh, so quickly, within 48 hours, we were in pretty good shape. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, our partners with Eversource were stationed at YPD with us, and uh, when we gave them an address, they dispatched the team. And I think um, I've heard a lot of accolades up and down the Cape about Team Yarmouth's response, and I could never be more prouder than I am having gone through this with them. This is, uh, we've had a number of practice events, and this was the big show. And uh, interestingly, we had a joint town emergency management exercise put on by Mass Maritime. We gave you a briefing about that in April, and it had been like the first time Dennis and Yarmouth sat in a room to talk about what we would do together in the event. In that particular case, it was a snowstorm. And now Dennis, Harwich, and Yarmouth are working all three together, sharing resources off Cape Mutual Aid to clean up our towns. And uh, it's been a fabulous experience. So I just wanted you to know that. I might mention, too, that um, at that initial meeting with the governor, uh, Dan, 
had quite a bit to say because he had been through this kind of an event when he was the mayor of Westfield. So um, you were very familiar with this kind of a disaster and which agencies were involved and what the immediate problems were and everything like that and had a lot of, he had a lot of good dialogue um, to offer at that meeting. Uh, as somebody said, disaster seems to follow him wherever he goes. Sadly so. <laughs> now I got three tornadoes under my belt. He's so. got three tornadoes. Time to retire. He's got the yep. great flood, yep. right? And since he's arrived here, they're putting out signs on the beaches for sharks. Sharks. <laughs> so. I'm very sorry for all that. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. So next item is Mass DOT Special Speed Regulations on Center Street. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Colby could address that issue, there's a special legislation or special mass DOT motion that's needed to uh, install the speed limit reductions there. Mr. Colby could speak to that, please. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we applied uh, back earlier this year, actually towards the end of last year, to reduce the speed limits on Center Street, and that was based upon some neighborhood uh, uh, meetings as well as a traffic study done by the town's uh, um, consultant, uh, VHB, recommending uh, speeds be lowered both on the straightaway of uh, Center Street as well as the curved area that heads towards uh, the beach. The state agreed with the straight section of Center Street that that should be a 30 mile an hour posting, which it currently is 35, but they did not agree with the curved area towards the beach. They thought that should remain at 25. That information is in your packet. Uh, like everything with Mass DOT, there is a process and there are permits and forms to sign, and they are asking the Board of Selectmen to accept their uh, special speed regulation uh, that's written up and in your packet and basically details those two or uh, that one zone that they recommended dropping the speed on make a motion to accept the recommendation second okay we have a motion in a second to accept the, re the recommendation is there any further discussion all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I ask a quick question? Sure, go ahead. Um, I guess the question is, the speed limits will drop. Is there anything else that's going to take place actually on the street to enforce the fact that there is a speed limit? The speed limit doesn't seem to have much effect. I'm just, just curious. Chief has a, a response, I believe. We're going to shoot people that speed over there, Chief. No, we will not do that. <laughs> we will not do that. There is, uh, you know, we've we've been going through this for quite a bit of time. Uh, Center Street studies have been done. As a result, you get the reduced speed area in one area. Mm -hmm. uh, road changes what we can do those are something else that i think is still being considered in addition to the speed this was just one one piece um we have somebody down there every night i know you don't think so but they are um and what you find even with all the studies that have been done there's not as much speed as you think it's not as much and and the studies have bared those out do we have people that will go quicker than others at certain times they will we try to address those with uh, presence with running radar but we can't stop what we don't what we uh, don't see so it is being done can we keep trying to put more down there we will uh, we do know that um, uh, we have someone there every night at sunset can you tell me i'm just curious where uh, i'm not exactly sure uh, where they go they set up in a different spot each night are, so. are they actually set up for speed control that's, with radar? That's their directive. Every cruiser has a uh, radar in it. I, I've never seen radar on Center Street in all the time that I've been up and down okay. that street. I'll never tell you what. It. I'll change the directive and I'll put them right in front of your house. How's that? <laughs> I can do that. You know, very simple. I, I, all, all I'm saying, Chief, is yep. I've, I've never seen I've never seen a car stopped with uh, mm -hmm. uh, an officer out asking, uh, you know, for license and, and registration. All right. Uh, never. Uh, two th I have uh, the data here. Uh, 2019, there were 11 directed patrols. Uh, 
which direct, directed patrol is radar enforcement. Um, their uh, response to the motor vehicle complaints, 17. They had seven traffic stops, three uh, non-speed related citations issued. There's been one accident in that area during that time. Uh, from a vehicle backing out of a driveway. 2018, uh, there were 16 inches of radar patrol, uh, six motor vehicle complaints, six stops, two citations. Now, mind you, this is just from the people we have assigned to traffic. This does not include patrol officers who were there Mm -hmm. um, on routine patrol that are always encouraged to hit those areas, along with the other areas. Uh, speeding is the biggest complaint we have across the town. 250 miles, we try to address it. You've heard this before. I don't want to bore you, because you want action. You want cars going slower. Um, well, you know, I, I think, yep. uh, you know, as I said, uh, we haven't mm -hmm. seen that much. I know from experience mm -hmm. elsewhere, mm -hmm. When people see the speed limits enforced mm -hmm. and enforced consistently, not just once every month, but mm -hmm. for some right. consistent period of time, and it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I, I think a block of time is more mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. than once a month because the block of time puts it in people's minds, hey, I gotta slow down because the, the guys are out here and uh, you know, I'm gonna pay attention to the speed limits. And I think it's particularly critical now that we're changing the limits. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree, that's a, that's a new education piece that has to go in there because like I said, a lot of those cars you think are speeding, they're, they're not going as fast as you think. Uh, and the, the motorcycles that I've seen on this street. I'm, and, 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 I'm not going to say that you won't. And, and, and the landscaping vehicles. And, yeah. the, uh, you know, there's a. <laughs> I agree with uh, uh, Ruth. Uh, there's a lot of speeding on the street. Mm -hmm. There are also repeat. I can identify some of the repeat offenders. Not that mm -hmm. I'm going to go out and look for somebody's license plate. But I can tell you that there are. And I can describe <laughs> yeah. some of them. And yeah. we're talking levels of speed that make your, you know, your hair's on fire. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a block of time, let's say I'm just throwing it out there, a, a month, there was a police presence there every day mm -hmm. from a certain time to a certain time, right. and I don't know, use radar, mm -hmm. whatever it is that, that you do and would increase the chances that someone who does that habitually might get caught mm -hmm. and ticketed. No, I mean, it you're might, right. It we're, might we're, we're effective when we know a particular individual. That's relatively easy to do because we've done that in other instances where we know who it is, we go to them, and we, we have a, a sit down. And generally that's very effective. Mm -hmm. This is a, a different area where you get, from what I understand, people racing down to sunset is the most common piece we hear and then it gets busy during the day at various times depending on the tide uh, so it's kind of unpredictable when you get a lot of things and then you have events that get take place and you get this uh, thermometer type thing where you get lots of people at the end and there's only one way to get there um, so we'll, we'll uh, do the very best I can As a matter of fact um, we are reformulating uh, our proactive anti-crime unit to add speed uh, issues more in their wheelhouse, uh, moving away from some of the issue, other issues, not that we're going to stop doing other things, but that's going to be one to get it a little more, more organized so that I can give you a better report on exactly what's taking place. It should be fairly easy to do. Um, but I just caution you don't think that we're going to get like tons of tickets because we've got the data we'll have to be there and catch that be there at the right moment at the right time i'm sure you've all discussed it but i'm just curious the study that was done when mm -hmm. was that? we've had uh two or three different okay. speed studies okay. done the cape cod commission has done at least two i believe and we've had our own uh, our readers last down year, there. The, uh, we did one last Mr. Year. Chairman, uh, it seems that our meeting is getting hijacked. Didn't at the beginning? Didn't you announce that public comment wasn't going? I to I did. Be taken? So that's 
I was going to give her the courtesy of just a few questions because well, she's she's establishing a dialogue between she and the chief, and we're spectators at this point. Okay. Excellent. Why don't you come and see me? All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to the next item. Recap what, could you recap what the speed limits will be now on Center Street? That was what you just voted. I think they're going to be reduced by, was it five miles an hour, was it? Right. What was that? Um, Mr. Chair, I could recap that uh, briefly. And that no, is... 35 to 30 and 35 to 25 in another area. Right? No. Uh, the straight section, it will now be 30 as opposed to the current posting of 35. Right. That's the, the major change in, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. okay. 30 is staying at 30. Or the All right. Water Division quarterly updates we're moving to right now. Who's got that? Jeff. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jeff Colby, Public Works Director again. Uh, the last time we were before you doing a water update, we had the full uh, management team here. Uh, we did a high-level overview uh, presentation on the water system, uh, you know, number of hydrants, wells, things of that nature. Uh, for this one, I wanted to do a more targeted uh, update, and so I took a stab at developing a format report of what that could look like. It's in your packets tonight. I wanted it to be targeted but useful to the board of the various activities that have happened over the last quarter. Uh, Based upon uh, some of the feedback we got from the board at that uh, first update uh, several months ago, I developed each one of these areas to try to address a comment that I, I heard that night, whether it's a specific project, uh, whether it's a water quality section, or whether it's just general kind of management updates. That should all be part of this report, and, and hopefully that is, is useful to you. Uh, as we go through this, and I'll, I'll cover this pretty quickly, uh, if there's other things that you'd like to see or, or more thorough in, in um, uh, elaboration of some points, you know, please let me know. Uh, but I thought it would be appropriate to cover budget uh, in the first section, especially here as we're starting a new fiscal year. Uh, so you'll see that in your, uh, in your memo uh, with regards to the budget, what was appropriate at town meeting, but where we stand. And we were under budget for FY19. Beginning FY20, we're starting to work on the contracts and purchase orders associated with that. And the specific numbers are in <coughs> the budget, in the, um, the report that you have, excuse me. Uh, the next section I thought would be important to highlight is water revenue. Uh, through May 31st, we were at uh, just over $4 million, which was uh, above what our projected uh, budget is. So that's good news. We're exceeding what we uh, are looking to spend in, with what came in. So that, that's all good numbers, and I thought things to highlight in the report. Uh, the next section, and I won't cover all the details and numbers, you can see that there, but I thought it would be important to highlight for you the amount of water that was pumped, uh, not only last year, but uh, through the first half of this year. And just the, the one number, because it, it's a big number, is 563.4 million gallons of water was pumped just in the previous six year period, or six month period, sorry. Uh, also on the water quality front, I talked about last time we were here, but the monitor well network associated with well number nine, uh, that's the well that has uh, uh, PCEs detected in it, and we're starting to develop the sampling associated with that. That's not a, a well that's online, but we want to understand the impacts and whether that plume is moving past that well or not. So that's uh, the water quality section update. The other thing I'll mention there is every three years EPA asks us to sample some additional elements that we're not sampling on a uh, quarterly, yearly, or monthly, or even daily basis that we do now with all the regular stuff that's required by DEP. And that three-year sampling will occur later this summer. So there's some additional water quality sampling that's happening. Jeff, if I might, uh, are there any Certainly. like particular analytes that they're asking for that we might be familiar with that have been in the news lately? Uh, I don't have that information for you. I don't believe the, the PFOS is the yeah. big one that we're, we right. talked about last time, that there's a big concern. I don't believe that's among this okay. uh, sampling. It's probably more related to heavy metals, things of that nature, um, not things we routinely sample for, but I don't believe PFOS yeah. was in that. And then next quarterly update, if we could have that. We'll have that information for you, what was sampled and what we found, absolutely. 
Uh, that's re required information as part of our, our uh, annual statistical report that gets reported to all the water users, but we'll certainly highlight that for the board. And then I thought a section on projects would be important for the board to understand what uh, the projects that are in the queue, what's uh, currently being worked. You can see a number of them there. Uh, the first one is one that I'd like to highlight. It's not one that we expected when we uh, began this uh, calendar year, but in transitioning to a new software system to uh, support the water system and uh, you know, billing enhancements as well as some customer service improvements with what how people can interact with the data associated with what they're using. Uh, uh, it was determined that we needed to reprogram 9,000 water meters, and we have approximately 16,000 in the system. So that was a huge effort that the water staff has undertaken. I am happy to report that at this point, they're two-thirds done reprogramming those, and those are something that has to be done on a house-by-house -house basis, and those are uh, well underway. We do expect, as I've mentioned here in the report, that by Labor Day, we hope to be complete with that. So that's a huge undertaking. I was very concerned with that at first, because just doing the math of real uh, reprogramming six water meters an hour, you know, what did that look like? And it basically looked like two years worth of time for one person to do that. So with a relatively small staff, we've been able to accomplish quite a few of those in-house, and that's a, a testament to how much the, the staff is getting taken care of relative to that. So that'll be a smooth transition to our software system after Labor Day once that's completed. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight for the board <coughs> was related to the master plan. Uh, that's currently being developed. We do expect that to be available later this year. Uh, also in preparation for the, uh, the next project down in preparation for the uh, 2021 budget submission, we're updating the five-year capital plan. That'll be a good uh, exercise. We haven't gotten uh, the exact dates of when that's due, but we do expect that to be very soon. And given the, the level of projects and amount of activity that we have in water, we've begun that process to lay those projects out uh, over the next five years, and we'll have that for you. Uh, hydrant maintenance, uh, our target is 20% of the hydrants to be painted and maintained each year. Uh, we have our summer staff uh, dedicated to that specifically, that seasonal staff. And at this point, uh, we're making good progress, but uh, given that we've had a uh, recent um, uh, summer staff that was bitten by a dog and, and we've had some other challenges with filling positions, uh, we may need to bring on some contractor support this fall to finish that uh, target goal, uh, but we are on track to meet that uh, this year, even if we need to bring on some contractors contract support to finish that. Uh, valve exercising and flushing is another important element and we have finished the unidirectional flushing model. I think I've mentioned that uh, in previous, uh, that that was an effort that we were undergoing in previous um, updates to the board, and that is something that's been completed. We're working on procurement documents to have that uh, more extensive flushing uh, happen this fall, so that's uh, on track as well. It uh, is important to note it won't be uh, every valve in every section of town. That's a very extensive effort, but we are gonna do some elements of it and pilot and see what amount of time and effort that takes, but there'll be some uh, improvements on that and some activity under that uh, this fall. Uh, pump station improvements, we'll have more on the uh, five-year uh, capital improvement plan, but just to highlight in a very high level, that's a four and a half million dollar program where we're removing uh, asbestos that's in some of the pump stations. We're um, making safe some of the confined space entries. These are relatively old pump stations that haven't been uh, upgraded since the 60s and we're undertaking that effort. It's in a phased program and we do have funding based upon previous capital programs for all of phase one. So we're working on developing the procurement documents for getting phase one completed and then in the next couple budget cycles, we'll have phase two and phase three as part of those. You'll, you'll hear more about those as we go through the uh, capital plan. Uh, SCADA upgrade and Sandy Pond uh, tank painting are a couple of the other uh, projects on here. Uh, leak detection is something that the general manager is assisting us with with regards to documentation and developing policies for. Uh, we have some fencing and security upgrades. Uh, well redevelopment, a uh, very important aspect, and we were able to do our four uh, of the wells this year. We target four to five every year, and the wells that we did this year were wells number 15, 19, 22, and 23 were all redeveloped, so they'll be good uh, for production purposes and capacity uh, for the next uh, six-year cycle uh, that we're on. 
Uh, Kamakwit Heights Water Service is another thing the board has been before the board uh, with regards to the support we're providing to that segment of town. So we're going to investigate what that looks like if we were to connect them with water. That's a pretty extensive project, but we've uh, begun the process of having uh, a water consultant take a look at more detailed costs and efforts associated with that. And then utility cloud implementation, that's our uh, software system. The next phase will be moving towards work orders. Right now we are in uh, the cross connections and other inspection documents that, are in, that live within that software system. And work orders are the next component. Uh, there's also several projects that were completed uh, this quarter. Several of those are related to a sanitary survey that DEP came in and did. They do that every three years, and they were very happy with uh, how our system looked and, and uh, was uh, operating. They asked an, uh, for a couple additional elements of information, and that related to the cross-connection plan and verifying and auditing of that information, and those are under the completed projects because when they asked for it, we quickly turned that around and got them to them, and they were very pleased with that information. Uh, and then finally, the last uh, couple of uh, updated items on the uh, report here relate to uh, the board was interested in customer service improvements. Uh, we have had some turnover within the Water Division administrative staff. Uh, there is additional hiring and training that's going on with new staff. I think even Dan reported that in one of the town administrator updates uh, just a couple of meetings ago. And once that's completed, we'll be in a much better strength. Uh, we'll be at full strength in a much better situation with regards to customer service. Uh, there was some uh, questions about management and outsourcing extent. Uh, we do need to take a look at what uh, uh, the future holds because the general manager contract is set to expire on September 30th, 2019, and what that looks like uh, is something that we're looking at the various options for. I will certainly have uh, much more detail for you at the next quarterly update. Uh, at this point, I need to talk um, uh, with the town administrator about the different options we have available to us, uh, specifically uh, the direction we might be looking to go with wastewater and whether we want to bring on and fill a position of water and wastewater superintendent is something we want to continue to explore. And then the last item is just job description update process, uh, adding licenses into the job description, and that is uh, currently nearing completion, at least our portion of the review, and that'll kick into the phase that goes before the personnel board for their approval and regrading of those positions. So that's uh, some very targeted project information uh, and update relative to the water system, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And as I indicated, I'd like to tailor this document to be informational and helpful to you. So if there's improvements you'd like to see to this, let me know. Okay. Um, Norm, do you have any questions? Nothing specific at this point, no. Tracy? I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of great information here. It's great to see all the progress. Um, I'm looking forward to what your recommendation is long term in terms of the management, but I just want to say thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, two questions. Number one, how was the, um, what was the resolution to the current Kamaquid Heights water billing issue? The current resolution is the board has a signed agreement with the town of Barnstable. Mm. It's paying us over the next three years for the, what is essentially a difference in the rates. And so for over the next three years, they'll receive a yearly check to compensate them for the difference between what they're paying now and the Yarmouth rates. But that's not a long-term solution. So we're looking at what long-term <laughs> solutions might be and what they might cost. Uh, and one other thing, if I may please ask that uh, in addition to this very thorough document that you've prepared for us tonight, that you start to consider um, rate increase projections. You know, we had a little bit of a discussion last time you were here, and um, I think we all know that at some point it has to come. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start to talk about what it's going to look like. Yeah, so. ab absolutely, and that's one thing I passed through very quickly, but under master plan, we do have it tied to that document. At the completion of that, we'll be in a much better position to uh, have that rate study completed relatively quickly. Thank you. Mark? No, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you, for Jeff. Uh, this is a terrific report. I like the layout, the format, very brief to the point, sort of getting at the essence of what's going on with each of these items, I think. What's very, very clear is that you've got a lot of work going on within the Water Department, and uh, it's very impressive to see some of the progress that's being made across the board. Uh, I, I'm, I, I have m noted in the past the whole valve exercising flushing in the hydrant uh, initiative, and I appreciate uh, that becoming a priority, so thank you. 
right. thank you Jeff, I just had a question as to the redevelopment of these wells. You mentioned 15, 19, 22, 23. Can you tell me what's entailed in developing, redeveloping a well and um, how that manages to improve the yield and capacity of performance going forward? Certainly. Uh, like I mentioned, we target four to five of these, and then we do them on a rotating basis. So approximately every six years, we're getting to each one. And you can think of it as pre pre preventive maintenance or cleaning of the well, if you will. Uh, the well is uh, sunk fairly deep into the ground. and has a screen associated with it in which it draws the water through the soil and up into the system. And that screen can get plugged or uh, elements can affect that screen. Sometimes when they redevelop a well, they have to replace components like the screen or the pump, things like that. So it's really a very detailed, thorough, preventive maintenance program for each well is what it is. Okay. Um, and uh, I just want to echo um, Eric's comments about getting at least a tentative plan for water increases and have the opportunity well in advance of implementing those increases so that the board can consider them and um, get get whatever comment and analysis that that we want to provide so other than that thank you very much for your report okay thank you okay next item dpw building committee update <laughs> Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Joe Rodericks. Uh, I'm chairman of the building committee. Um, in the audience, unless somebody sneaks in late, we have Judy Tarver, um, Kurt Sears, Brian Gardner, Mark Galkowski. Uh, other members of the committee were Eric Tolley, um, Jeff Colby, and uh, a couple presidents, Sharon Weimer, uh, and Tom Griffith. They're not here. <clears throat> um, tonight we are giving you a, an update, a uh, full update of something uh, relative to the report uh, that you um, are, should be expecting uh, in time for the special town meeting. Uh, it's an update from, I think, last year is the last time we were here with a full update. Members of uh, the architect team of Weston and Sampson, Jeff Alberti and Tony Weisbeiser, uh, we're here to make the presentation. We also have... Um, uh, Wes Stinson from, <coughs> excuse me, the, the town's uh, project manager, environmental partners. Um, Jeff Alberti will give the presentation momentarily, but as chairman, I feel it uh, is my, my responsibility, you've seen this in your packet, to advise the public that the bad news or the not so good news is that the project costs have uh, gone up slightly. Uh, Jeff will uh, give you more detail on that in his presentation, but um, some of this is through design change. Some of it is from things we can't control, such as uh, cost escalations due to tariffs or whatever. Uh, and then what I'd like to just highlight is the biggest number was from the design exploration of the site that discovered uh, deleterious material there or, or non-suitable material that will have to be excavated and, <coughs> and replaced. Um, so with that, we've gone from a $14.6 million number to approximately 15.3 since the last time I believe that you uh, heard numbers. Um, Unless you have any other further questions for me, I'll turn it over to Jeff. May let him make the presentation. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Alberti. I'm a project manager with Weston and Sampson. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to present to you this evening. And I have prepared a overall summary of the project. Some of this information was originally uh, presented uh, over a year, year and a half ago. But I just wanted to touch on some of the items. And the agenda of this presentation is to focus on uh, upfront the public works responsibilities, and that's important because that's what really drives this facility. And then moving to why does the town need a new facility, just showing you some quick photographs of the current conditions. Uh, I will skip through those quickly. I know you have a large agenda, so I'll try to move expeditiously through that, but I'm happy to go back if you do want to see anything in more detail. I'll spend a little bit more time on what is proposed, where the committee has worked with us to come to for this project, and then close with what the benefits are of a new and improved facility. 
So starting with the public works responsibilities, I could spend a whole presentation just talking about some of their responsibilities, but I just wanted to highlight some of them. And really the first line says it all where the DPW touches the lives of the residents every day by maintaining that infrastructure that the community relies on. And I list a series of some of the major responsibilities on the slides in front of you. Uh, what's also important to note is we have this and we've given this slide presentation time and time again that DPW is on call 24 hours a day to handle all sorts of emergencies. This slide was much easier for me to prepare leading into this presentation uh, having watched what has been going on in this community and just listening uh, f you know the last half hour. Uh, but some of the responsibilities include 24 hour day operations for snow and ice removal, hurricane, windstorm, and obviously the tornado cleanup that you've all been dealing with. Um, so I think it really says a lot about public works is considered a, a first responder and it works with the other first responders in a community. And American Public Works magazine said it best where they indicate that public works, they're the first responders who are there until the emergency is over. And as, I, as you could hear, they're still out there doing that cleanup. So a lot of this is important because this is what's driving the size of the facility, the shape and configuration, trying to come up with a safe and efficient facility that allows public works to get out and serve the community on a daily basis uh, for regular operations as well as in emergency situations. So with regard to why the town needs a new facility, um, there really starts with the building's ages, the main building, the main green building that's on site. It's uh, more than 45 years old. The ancillary support structures, some of them are more than 70 years old. And over that time, the operations have changed significantly, but the facilities have not kept pace. And as you can see from some of these facilities, uh, some of these photographs, these buildings have uh, exceeded their useful life. They have served the community well. Uh, it's time for some upgrades to serve today's um, to public works operations. As you move inside, some of the things that we noted was the vehicle maintenance area, very congested. In fact, they have the vehicle maintenance area in the middle of the vehicle storage area. You have to pull all the equipment out in order to do maintenance on the vehicles. You can see some more congested photos of the materials that are stored within these bays, making it very inefficient. What's also important to note is if you look at the types of vehicles that were around when the facility was constructed on the left-hand side, and you look at today's equipment, today's equipment is much larger multi-use equipment. It just does not fit within these older buildings as you can see from this photograph. And in fact, as we went through and looked at more and more pictures, we found areas where if you blow up this picture here on the right-hand side, you can actually see that the mirrors are in fact overlapping. In order to protect this multi-million dollar fleet, they have to put as much equipment indoors as they can. And as a result, you have equipment that is only inches apart when it's parked. What we also found was there's a lot of equipment that does not fit inside these buildings, and as a result, that's left outdoors. And this really becomes uh, inefficient and dangerous for the staff. This is a video showing some snow operations uh, in the recent past year where all the staff is outdoors trying to hook up plows in a driving snowstorm. So this can be quite dangerous for the staff. It is also quite inefficient, and it causes delays in getting the staff out on the roads. This is a photograph of what a new facility and what your facility will include, and that's the ability to have that equipment undercover, protecting the life expectancy of that equipment, but also improving the safety and efficiency of operations. And in fact, this is a video of a recently completed facility where the staff ha have that equipment indoors. The equipment operation and the connection of the plows is done in a minimally heated garage, well lit, much more safe, much more efficient, allows the equipment to get out onto the streets. And that in turn results in improved public safety by having the equipment out versus stuck in the yard. Wash operations are essentially non-existent and we have some photographs showing the staff outdoors in freezing cold temperatures trying to maintain this multi-million multi dollar fleet, whereas it should be done undercover as shown in the example photograph in front of you now. So in summary, the buildings are 45 to 70 years old. The existing buildings don't meet today's building codes. They don't meet today's plumbing codes, mechanical codes, and all of this contributes to the operational inefficiencies. The reason I wanted to give you this summary is that this really was our driving factor in coming up with a new facility that will address these deficiencies now and into the future. It's also important to note that there are definitely risks. A lot of people say, well, they're doing a great job now. Do we really need a new facility? And we keep our eyes on the headlines, and these just show some photographs over the last five to six years of 
uh, DPW facilities that have actually burnt down when a vehicle caught on fire, no sprinkler system, they lose their fleet in the middle of a winter and during storms, uh, can be devastating to a community in the, in the safety of the community. So just some things to consider that we're looking to improve and provide you with the pr proper protection measures to protect your fleet and your staff. Okay, so we'll move into uh, the more fun stuff, and that is what is proposed. So we've spent a lot of time with Public Works and their staff. We wanted to understand your operations and build this around your operations. We interviewed staff. We developed programming sketches for each and every space to go within this facility. We worked with the committee and the staff to fine-tune that to come up with a preferred program. And th on your screen now is the current proposed final floor plan. And it really consists of three main components. The upper U-shaped component represents the offices, employee facilities, and some small trade workshop areas. The large centerpiece is the vehicle and equipment storage area. That's where we'll get that equipment undercover. It's a minimally heated, uh, low-cost type of construction. And in the bottom left, we have the vehicle maintenance in the vehicle wash bay so that that can be done properly in undercover. So if you take that floor plan, and just to give you uh, an understanding of how that fits on the site, I've shrunk it down here and superimposed it onto the site plan. And as you can see on the current site with Buck Island Road running across the top of your screen and Townbrook Road on the left-hand side and the proposed building shown in the shaded orange. And as we zoom out, one of our goals here was to try to maintain as much of the existing structures on site during construction because we can't shut down this operations and we want it to be efficient and allow them to continue to work while the facility is being constructed. So as we move into the overall site plan, you can see the building. On the right-hand side, we're maintaining that existing building that was uh, built in the 70s so that we can provide just some basic minimally uh, covered storage for some of that equipment that helped us to reduce the overall footprint of the building. And as you take a look at that facility shown by the red arrow, this is a conceptual rendering of what that might look like or what it will look like essentially because we're moving through design at this point. And we've, we've really worked to break up the massing because it is a, a larger building and we've provided the front administration, office, and employee facilities in a lower massing. Then the shops on the right hand side begin to increase in massing and behind that is the vehicle and equipment storage and maintenance. So it's a very cost effective, uh, it's a pre-engineered metal building but we've improved some of the aesthetic quality of the exterior with some uh, different types of paneling systems and ultimately feel that it fits well into the neighborhood and provides the, the town with a very cost-effective building. So moving through that process and discussing the costs, this is an overall summary of the cost and we really broke it down. I have a lot of details but focus in on two of the major components. The first is the construction costs and to help understand how that fits into the current market that runs about, uh, th we have a range of 344 to $362 a square foot. And what we've tried to project here is what the average bid price is and what the low bid price could be in a competitive market. Generally over the last year, we've seen a very um, uh, non-competitive market, meaning contractors are very busy and as a result, we're not getting uh, the low bids that we've seen in the past. And that's due to a strong economy. And so that's been reflected in uh, these numbers. And then you add in the soft cost below that to come up with the range that Joe mentioned earlier of 14.6 uh, to 15.3 uh, for that overall range. Now in comparative, for comparative purposes, we took a look at recent facilities and we've escalated those costs. Those recent facilities, and we've included in there the town of Bourne, uh, the town of Orleans, they range somewhere in the $388 per square foot. Through our process, as I mentioned, we're in the 340 to 360 range. We're slightly less than that overall average for the other communities, primarily based on the fact that we're using uh, town forces to complete some of the site work separately and funding some of the uh, site components separately. So through that process, we're able to keep the overall cost down. Um, just in closing, there are a lot of benefits associated with the new facility. I've touched on a few of them through the process, but I just wanted to zoom in on a couple, starting with it provides the town with a code-compliant, safe work environment for town employees, one that really does not exist today due to the age and size of these existing facilities. 
it protects that multi-million dollar investment that you've invested as a community in the vehicles and equipment that are used by Public Works. It'll be much more efficient workspace. It'll improve response times, allowing DPW to better serve the community. It creates a more consolidation, consolidated operations, improving those efficiencies. It eliminates the need to invest in Band-Aids for these old facilities, and it does replace a facility that is long past its useful life before it becomes one of those mandated emergency replacements that I showed you earlier in some of the other communities. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe, and uh, I believe we can have some, oh, I'm sorry, I do have some next steps real quick. The next steps um, for us are we're in the process of finalizing design uh, with an anticipated completion date in September. Through that process, uh, we've gone through and working on the pre-qualification of bidders. We'll open up bids in October, providing uh, an actual number, so no estimates at this point. We'll have hard numbers from a contractor and understand where those bids fall for the November 19, 2019 town meeting. And if approved through that process, completing the construction by March 2021. So I'll turn it back over to Joe Rodericks. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Um, moving forward, uh, following this uh, meeting and your comments, and uh, what we're uh, going forward with is a joint, next week we'll have a uh, August 7th, a joint meeting of the Finance and Capital Budget Committee on, on the 7th of August. <clears throat> we'll make our presentation there as well. Um, from there, we hope to, uh, we have committee members currently working on a, uh, a brochure that we hope to be able to put up in, in uh, town hall, um, possibly to go out to some of the, uh, uh, I don't say fairs, but like Seaside Festival, maybe have a kiosk or something. But to get out there and do uh, basically, um, you know, open houses, public information to the public in anticipation of moving to the uh, the special town meeting in the fall, and informing the the uh, residents and taxpayers of the need for this project. So with that, if you have any questions of Jeff or myself or any member of the committee. I don't have anything at this time. Thank Crazy. you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to get an update. Um, I think it's coming close to the time that we're, it's going to be go time, so this information is going to be really helpful. Um, I guess I was just interested to see the size of the facility at first. It looks um, like a lot of square footage, but in terms of community size and the other size of the buildings and the other communities, it looks um, fairly in line. Um, you talked, Jeff, about the way you were gonna do the, the bid in terms of breaking it up to have uh, cost savings. What, what did you mean by that? Um, with regard to town forces? Pardon? W with regard to town forces, trying to keep the numbers down, is that what yeah, you Yeah, yep, you were talking about you were gonna put it out, uh, is it gonna be one, is it gonna be one contract? Oh yes, an issue? one contract, um, but primarily what our intention is that we'll be able to build the center area, which is the main facility, and then be able to relocate operations into uh, the new building, and then they can do demolition and finish up the site work. So that'll be a, a slight bit of phasing, but what that'll prevent is um, if that building landed on top of one of the, let's say that large green building that's on site there now, mm -hmm. then we would have had to demolish that and rent trailers to put up all the staff. I think what you're talking about is similar to what the Highness Fire Station's doing. I think that they're doing a phased approach. They're in there open, um, but there's still construction on a part of the facility. Yes, that sounds exactly what we're doing. Okay, and in terms of the contingency, what percentage is that? Uh, the contingency that's carried uh, is typically for design contingency in the, um, for the construction, I should say, it's about 5%. Okay. Is that industry standard? Yes, usually when we get closer to the end, uh, we start off around 8%, and as we begin to identify uh, unknowns and feel more comfortable with uh, the findings of us, such as the subsurface investigation, 5% is typically the lowest that we recommend going. Right, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Norm. Great, thank you. Uh, very informative, helpful. Uh, 
give us a, certainly a better understanding. Uh, pictures are always great. <laughs> they help to uh, help, uh, help us visualize what's going on. Um, I do have some spe specific questions, um, uh, a couple on the budget. One was on the temporary facilities, and I'm wondering uh, uh, if you could explain that. Let me just uh, pull up my notes. So the temporary facilities, there will be a portion of time when we're going to need to uh, demol demolish some of the structures, and we're going to have to provide uh, some rerouting of utilities to support temporary operations. This is the $50,000 that you're referring to? Right. And so that's just generally there to accommodate that sequencing. So there'll be moving costs associated with moving operations from one area to the other. So this provides the temporary support infrastructure that's needed to keep the operations running. So it's going to, we haven't pinpointed the exact use of that. It's an allowance to cover any of those um, phasing opportunities that are going to be uh, presented through this construction. Okay. Well, it, it just seemed pretty generous at this point, given that we're not really replacing or uh, the the facility is going on land that's unused at this point, isn't it? Uh, it's going on the site of 507 Buck Island Road on the existing DPW site. Right. And so are we demolishing all the buildings that it's replacing? Um, all except for the large green building that exists there now. Okay. And, and why is that remaining? Uh, we felt we could save some costs by repurposing that just for vehicle and equipment storage. If we had not saved that building, we would have had to have added some more new construction, which would have been a lot more expensive. So we were keeping that, just using that for vehicle and equipment storage, and therefore requiring uh, minimal upgrades to that. I see. So how much is going to have to be put into that building in terms of upgrading and, and, uh, and so forth? Well, essentially, it's being used now for vehicle maintenance and vehicle storage. Uh, aside from a couple of um, carbon monoxide detectors and an improved exhaust fan, we don't envision uh, there's any other major upgrades. We intend to keep using it for vehicle storage, therefore not triggering the upgrades. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I was wondering about the... Um, square footage of the new building compared to the existing facilities that are uh, being replaced and so th one of the items that we've done through this process is try to do a comparison and we took a look at the different uh, buildings and in fact there's one two three four there's about six or seven buildings on that site now if you total up just the, those facilities it's about 20,000 square feet uh, the proposed facility is at um, about 38,000, I'll use round numbers, 38,000 square feet. But what's important to note is that um, there's about 30,000 square feet of exterior storage of equipment in operations. So that really is going to be coming in. So if you look at a, a comparison um, based on what exists there on the site now, essentially we're going to be providing uh, similar square footage, by, but we're taking the out, outdoor material and equipment and putting that under cover to protect it. Okay. And and so the, uh, the existing green building that's remaining, how big is that? 8,000 square feet. 8,000? Yes. Okay. So so essentially we're going to 46,000 square feet. Correct. Uh, 45 because I rounded up earlier. So essentially okay. it's about 45,000 total. So we're more than doubling the space of covered, correct, and that's covered. and it's twenty thousand covered, and about thirty thousand is stored equipment outdoors because it doesn't fit. Okay. Um, so we have we have um, it'll take all of that to contain the vehicles that we have now. Uh, the vehicles plus uh, the vehicle maintenance operation plus the wash bay, the trade shops, and then the office and employee facilities. Okay. And what, how much of that is office facility, and where is the, where are the current offices located? 
Uh, there are some supervisory offices within the green building, and then there's some offices in uh, Jeff Colby's area. And and some of the buildings that are being demolished. Yeah, I've got a quick answer for that. So one of the uh, overriding elements of this is consolidation. So my office is currently over at uh, 99 Buck Island with the water division. We can consolidate at this building. Also, there is some office space that's within the green building, the highway building. Uh, there are um, at least three uh, offices there that will be consolidated within this new building, as well as uh, park and cemetery have offices within the uh, wood-framed park building that really is just a series of garages they have two offices in there as well, all consolidated in the new facility under one general area of administrative offices. Okay. So, so, so what's the square footage of the office space? So the office is approximately 3,200 square feet. 3,200? Correct. Okay. Okay, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Tracy asked a key question in terms of comparison to similar communities. Uh, have, have we run those comparisons in terms of square footage of office and, and um, uh, storage areas and so forth? We have. We have gone through and, and uh, typically we like to tell everyone that a facility size is driven by three factors and that's the number of staff, uh, the number of divisions, and the number of vehicles. That's really what drives a public works facility and we've done a comparison based on that to other communities. And the reason that we don't base it necessarily on the size of a community or size of the town is that uh, some towns might only have one division and therefore need a smaller building whereas some might have eight divisions and, and they might be smaller in, in area but they need a lot more space for their operation. So going through that comparison, we've found that uh, we are in line with other communities of similar size. Uh, and it's important to note that through the process, this goes back maybe a year and a half to two years ago, we've actually gone through and gone through a refinement process working closely with D the DPW and the committee to really bring down that square footage to what we felt was the appropriate minimum amount without having an impact to the operations on day one. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I think I had uh, one other question with regard to the nature of the cons construction materials. Um, the existing facility is 45 years old. It looks like it was a metal panel. Is that correct? That's correct. Metal panel facility. Okay. So what is the uh, construction material going to be on the um, exterior of this building? So this will have... Um, I'll call it three different types. The entire perimeter and base will consist of a, a masonry, uh, concrete masonry unit, so a more durable base to provide some protection mm -hmm. for the lower level of the building. Uh, the front uh, main part of the building where the office and engineering and shops was, as I showed in one of these slides earlier, uh, will be a hardy board or a fiber cement type siding. And then as you move around to the more industrial areas of the building, we'll be going with a factory foam insulated metal panel. It's a sandwich system. So it's not like the, the flimsy metal panel you see on some of these older buildings that has the bagged insulation. Right. This is a four inch thick factory foam insulated panel. It's very durable, uh, provides a great um, return on your investment from an overall energy perspective. Uh, and then I'll have a standing seam metal roof. Okay, uh, standing seam? Yes. Okay. Um, and is, is that standard on uh, uh, DPW buildings at this stage? It is, yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and I guess the question on the, um, uh, you know, one of the typical issues with any vehicle um, storage facility is just uh, accidents. <laughs> And, uh, you know, in spite of best efforts, uh, drivers bumping into walls uh, and, um, you know, uh, metal ends up looking like it's uh, uh, had bullets uh, you mm -hmm. know, shot at or, or whatever, you know, big dents and so forth. And so it becomes very unsightly. 
and uh, uh, and I'm wondering uh, if, if we employed any kind of um, safeguards to avoid that sort of thing? Yes, um, number one, the circulation path and how we're parking the equipment is key so that we're not, we're trying to make sure that we're not driving these vehicles up against the building on the exterior whenever possible. Uh, we do provide uh, for interior and exterior bollards to protect the door openings. Okay. Um, so steel bollards. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, on the inside, especially in the vehicle storage area, we do have a um, reinforced concrete interior wall. So that provides the base so that if someone were to pull a plow up a little bit too tight, it would just be concrete that they would impact okay. and not the metal siding. All right. And so that's all accounted for to really build that nice durable base. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Uh, thank you for the um, the presentation. Um, I mean, I've been over there several times. There's, it's just significantly less than ideal. I think is the diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> some of, some of the place looks like it's just a real dump. You know, it's too bad maybe the tornadoes didn't touch down over there and save us a lot of time and trouble. Um, I'm glad you mentioned something about the doing the public outreach and the public information. I think I know sometimes people find that a grind and wonder whether or not there's the utility of it, but I've often found that the repetition, constant public education, awareness, involvement, open houses that were done before, I, I thought they were reasonably well attended, but I think all of that has to continue in the fall so the public has an opportunity to come in and see the facility, particularly well before town meeting. Um, you know, having flyers available, putting stuff on the website, Maybe before Chris Dwelly leaves to uh, Dover, we can work with him to sort of get a game plan together on how to improve media. Maybe we can do a YouTube video, do yeah. a TV video tour of the current facility and ha provide visuals on the new facility. I think we can't, I'm, I'm sure we can find some time uh, on the TV channel between sex offender um, bios um, <laughs> to put some to put some really good information out there for voters to even watch on TV you know we can we can take better utilization of uh, our TV channel so I applaud you for having that on your agenda I wouldn't skimp on it I would I would really go overboard on it I think it's very very important no, I, I would agree I, I think the committee just doing a tour of the existing facility had an eye-opening experience um, you know and Anybody who does the open house, I seriously recommend it because it will be eye-opening. But I also recommend you don't wear any good clothes <laughs> when you go through these buildings. Right. It is that much of a, a disaster area. Um, but we, ho we hope again to, 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 to the public, and, and I think that's probably just the closing, um, why I was asked 12 years ago to be chairman of this committee, backed by George Allaire and Bob Lawton to, to head this committee, as I had just finished building uh, the, the Don, town of Dennis's DPW facility. And I experienced firsthand, I saw what happened with the, the, the workers in, in that town, <clears throat> the response and what happened afterwards. And I can't impress on people, the public, that the, the bang for the buck you're gonna get with a new facility. Uh, your your snow plow, your, snow, your roads will be better, it'll be out there faster, it'll be safer for you. Equipment will be, you know, you're, you're gonna have cost savings uh, on equipment storage. Um, and in the town of Dennis, specifically what I saw was the morale boost was incredible of having safe and clean working environment. Uh, the, the troops became basically more efficient. Um, they were more productive. Uh, they actually started looking for work. And if you ever, I know we've had our differences with the town of Dennis, but if you look at the no. DPW, what happened over there, they went to an organization that was actually looking to go and do work, um, whether it be you know, outside, outside of the normal work. Uh, if, I, if I can just add to that point, Joe, yep. is, um, the things that I noticed right off the bat were the unsafe worker conditions. Yep. Yep. That, that to me, the liability, it also says something about the way we value or maybe not value enough our employees. Um, so I think that's, that's critically important. Poor ventilation is clearly an issue. Um, and um, 
you know, th th those often get lost in this discussion, but I, I would agree with you. I'm glad you pointed it out because they're incredibly important. And, and the truth is, over the years that, you know, I've lived in town for a long time, you know, we've cut, we've cut staff down, and, and most of the DPW has taken big hits over time. And if you don't have enough staff, you should at least make them more efficient by having the right equipment the right work environment, and you can recoup what you've probably lost with staff, you know, staff time. The one thing I didn't notice in the presentation, um, but maybe I missed it, um, was the fact that how critical it is to sort of make sure that your equipment is adequately sheltered. Um, we do have equipment right now, highway equipment, that is not adequately sheltered, and that is a huge issue from a maintenance point of view, longevity point of view, and so forth. Uh, I noticed that when I, when, I, when I went on my tour of the facility. I don't know if there's anything more to comment on that or add to that whole part of this. Sure, if, if you don't mind, I'll keep it brief, but um, we've done entire presentations on that, and to recap the benefits, um, number one, you're gonna see three to five years more on your equipment. Uh, and that's done through a case study, so we have some data to back that up. You're going to end up reducing your maintenance costs. Uh, you'll, you'll, have, um, you'll be able to have more scheduled maintenance versus the unscheduled maintenance, which can snowball and cost the town a lot of money. So those are some of the tangibles. Uh, and then on top of that, um, just being able to have that equipment respond in an efficient, safe manner is, is immeasurable. Um, for the staff and for the um, the overall public, so there there are so many benefits associated with it uh, that we we recommend it and pretty much do it on every single facility. We've done 130 uh, DPW facilities across New England, and I think every single one of them that's one of the major components is to protect that multi-million dollar investment and make it safe for the employees in those areas. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm Tracy set, Mr. Had a Chairman. Couple more questions. I'll just have a couple more. Uh, do we know yet what the estimated yeah. annual debt I'm done. will be? based on the projected uh, bid prices? Yeah, we're working on that. The, it was referenced earlier, it was a frequently asked questions and a brochure that's being put together that's gonna have that information in it. Okay. So I do know it's something we've asked Ed Sentio and he's provided it to us. I don't have it tonight, but it, it will be in the outreach document. Okay. Um, do we know of any additional operating costs on an ongoing basis that we'll need to plan for for this building f uh, for future budgets? Uh, so being that it is a larger building, the operating costs will uh, be going up associated with the facility. We're working on the life cycle cost estimates, which will help uh, provide those projections. Um, on a cost per square foot basis, it's more efficient. Cool. It's just that it's a larger space. Okay, and my last question is, and this is probably random, is this size structure going to trigger a Cape Cod Commission review? So we've gone through, and I know that um, we've, we've done a reach out to confirm that it does not, it's not um, applicable, but I'll have to confirm that and uh, we'll get that answer. Because if it does, these numbers are way out the door. Unfortunately, it will take, well, just the time of going through that process and Hopefully yeah. we could get an uh, exemption, but. Yeah, my, my experience has been that these facilities are exempt, but we'll get that um, an affirmative answer on Thank that. Thank you. The only thing I'd like to mention, I don't have any questions, is um, in furtherance of something Mark said, I think it was a year ago last March, they had an open house. I remember Chris was there, and seeing the facility, um, you really haven't told me tonight anything new that I didn't already know. And so what I'm saying, I guess, is that the information you get by actually going there, seeing it for yourself, talking to the people that work there, having them point out various issues with the building is extremely helpful and informative in understanding the overall need. Um, so back to Mark's point, I think, you know, as much outreach as you can do along those lines would be extremely beneficial. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Water Resource Advisory Committee Cost Recovery Plan. Before we, be, before we actually begin the discussion, um, we're just gonna deal with 
primarily the financial piece of this tonight. Um, Mark has sent some emails to Dan and I about um, some ideas about breaking down this wastewater and presentation in the segments, which, which I think is a very good suggestion and a very good idea. So when we get to um, agenda review tonight, I'm going to ask Mark to um, share those ideas with the board. Um, the concern is that, you know, at some point in time, we're going to have to make some major decisions about this project and to have, you know, one massive presentation in front of the board at the 11th hour isn't going to give us the kind of comprehension of, 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 the, of the various aspects of this that we probably should have. So um, Mark's concept is to, you know, deal this out in depth in measurable doses, and so we're going to pick up on that when we do the agenda review. So, David, you're on. Oh, sorry. Mr. Rich. Chairman, I'm Rich Bienvenu of uh, the, the Town of Yarmouth, uh, working with the Water Resource Advisory Committee. Uh, Kurt Sears is our chairman, and with us is David Young, our engineer from CDM Smith, and Jeff Colby, uh, Public Works Director, <coughs> who you've been introduced about four times tonight. So, uh, I'm not Jeff Colby. Um, the, the committee has been working uh, a little bit over eight months. Uh, we were in front of you about six months ago for an update as to kind of what we were seeing, what they were uh, thinking about, what they're contemplating. Uh, this is on the heels, as you all know, of 2011 when the town presented a plan that didn't pass a town meeting. And since that time, there's been some significant progress and in information gleaned. Um, as you know, we've completed our work on evaluating what we need to do in the Bass River watershed. Um, there's been a lot of work done on how could we, what could we potentially do to reduce the overall sewerage area that we might need to address. Um, there's actually some projects ongoing that um, I don't want to get into too many details because we've got a lot of, as uh, the chairman alluded to, a lot of ground to cover tonight and we'll start drilling down into some specifics. Uh, but for example, the Parkers River Bridge project is a significant project as it impacts wastewater. Um, we have a requirement of a high 90% over here on the part of nitrogen removable nitrogen removal in the Parkers River watershed, and we anticipate that Parkers River bridge widening project to reduce that to just under 70%. So that alone impacts the future and the uh, the totality of the plan. Uh, but what the committee has come to realize is the most cost-effective uh, way to reach the amount of nitrogen removal that the town's faced with uh, removing is a centralized treatment. And as we've always been saying, uh, this is always a work in process. We're building off the old eight-phase plan that we've talked about in 2016 of making this affordable, eight phases, one, year, one every five years roughly for a total of 40 years. But that is pure speculation of what that looks like, phases uh, eight and seven certainly. So we always keep saying, focus on what we need to do, what's in front of us today, which is phase one. Uh, phase one, uh, what has we built upon from 2016 uh, with the Bass River results in, is basically Route 28 from Barnstable to Dennis Town Line with the treatment plan at Buck Island Road. <coughs> Ultimately, uh, this is what the currently the required sewer area, nitrogen sensitive areas look like. And this plan would address eight phases. But our work is focused essentially on how do we even get started and focus on phase one. And so phase one is this map here, which is uh, adjoining parcels to Route 28. And as an alternative uh, that we're considering is down here on South Shore Drive. The primary reason for this is uh, water quality and nitrogen removal. Uh, but as you've heard, there's a, uh, one of the benefits of this we're hoping and expect based on studies that have been done is some economic development activity. Um, we have considered and discussed this as a Yarmouth only plan to start. 
like I said, a, a phase one collection system down 28 and South Shore Drive going to our Buck Island Road site. But as part of the due diligence that's been done since 2011 and 2016, we've evaluated um, cost saving opportunities by working with regional partners. Uh, the main one that you've been hearing about is the DHY Community Partnership, uh, where we, and under that concept, it's a separate working group that uh, you'll be hearing from shortly. We have a meeting this Friday. Um, where we'll be contemplating future meetings and a future outreach for that group. But that plan is uh, working on legislation, which is, uh, I just spoke to Rep. Whalen this earlier today, who tells me that in the next couple weeks we should see some action on that legislation, that which, would, which would enable the district in a working operating agreement that would govern how the district operates. And that would send uh, each town would be responsible for its collection system and send it to a central plant in the town of Dennis, which would be o owned by the community waste, uh, DHY Community Partnership and treated effluent back to each community. And so that in and of itself is a large discussion item, uh, but we do believe that has opportunities for some cost savings. For Yarmouth, the cost savings is represented more on the operating side, but there is some, I wouldn't call it intangible, but not direct uh, capital savings by uh, the opportunities to uh, save money on uh, either a subsidy or a 0% interest loan through our SRF revolving loan program. Uh, having a regional approach provides you more uh, credit, so to speak, when you apply for those programs. Uh, we are also evaluating options with the town of Barnstable, and we've done some preliminary work on that, and you have uh, on the DHY in particular, a very thick manual, which I believe I gave each of you the printed copy of that and also sent via email and a memo on Barnstable option via email. Uh, that work continues and has a little bit left to do, uh, but the long and the short of it is, it seems like the most cost effective option at this point is to send all our uh, collected wastewater to DHY facility and back to each community for a treat uh, effluent discharge. Overall, this is a very expensive proposition. Uh, the S eight phases are estimated at $400 million and an annual operating cost of about $10 million. But that's over the next 40 years. And as we keep saying, we really need to focus on phase one because uh, we hope that we can reduce, ultimately reduce this sewer area. And we don't know what technologies might be in place in the future that might help us to achieve that. Uh, so focusing on phase one, we think we have some opportunities to save some money through a regional uh, arrangement by coordinating work with the Mass DOT um, and hopefully uh, achieve the ability to get the 0% SRF loan. So focusing on phase one and transitioning into this cost recovery discussion, uh, what does that look like? On the Yarmouth only option we have an estimate of $112 million. Again, we're working to achieve some cost reduction through regional opportunities, road work, and through some design work. But using that 112 as kind of the upper limit, uh, if you took that 112 million on a zero interest loan with a 30 year amortization, we're talking about $3.73 million per year of annual debt service. Uh, that's a significant uh, reduction by achieving that 0% loan. Uh, if we had a 2% loan, which is another option under the SRF program, it's about a $35 million savings over the life by getting 0%. We think that's a, a realistic thing we can achieve, so we're building our projection on this 0% uh, 30-year loan. Uh, and the goal, of course, is to do that without having an impact on the general tax rate. Uh, that's been the, the mantra we've heard time in and, and time again every time we've done some outreach. However, just for a frame of reference, uh, just so you know where we're starting from, if that were on the tax rate, um, the impact's about 64 cents per thousand or $64 per hundred thousand evaluation. So for the, you know, the median or average, however you want to phrase it, home in Yarmouth of 300,000, uh, we're talking about 192 bucks. If you're talking about a million dollar home, you're talking about 640 bucks per year of additional tax rate. Of course, we're trying not to do that. So we've considered a lot of options to get there. Um, 
This is the old menu that you've heard a lot about over the last few years. I'm going to cut to the chase and summarize that. And again, uh, the devil's in the details. I've spoken with each of you on some of these details. Uh, this is summarized for our, our public presentation, but as we go forward over the next several months, we'll need to get into the very nitty gritty of the specifics of how we do this. But of that $3.7 million, um, we've broken it down into four different buckets, so to speak, of how to fund it. The first one, the most uh, uh, highest level of certainty to it is user-generated genera revenues, which be composed of a 20% betterment on the collection system only, which generates a little over $9 million, about $9 million. Also a 25% surcharge on the operating costs to each user, so these are paid, direct, uh, all these costs are paid by only those that are hooked up to the system. So you're a parcel adjacent to Route 28, uh, you're hooked up to the system, and you'll have a betterment over 30 years, perhaps, and also uh, a surcharge on your operating costs. And so just for a frame of reference, um, once we have some direction and, and want to move and drill down on some of this detail, uh, some of which we already have, um, you could, for some of these large commercial operations, a, a restaurant or a hotel, for example, you might be looking at a significant betterment. And I'm just going to use a round number for talking purposes here, but perhaps it's a $300,000 betterment, which you know sounds like a lot up front. But remember, these facilities are investing a lot of money in on-site treatment systems and paying a lot of money every year to operate them and monitor and test them. And then when you tell these people that, well, you've that gets added to your tax bill over 30 years, so you don't have to pay it all right now. And since we're paying presumably a 0% interest loan, the, our interest on that better, betterment will be pretty negligible as well. So essentially you're taking that $300,000 over 30 years and you're talking 10 grand a year. And all of a sudden that sounds very, not only palatable, but favorable perhaps. So this is one of the levers that we can, as we fl you know, flush this out, as we say, you know, work with uh, uh, you know, either up or down on any of these elements. But the user-generated revenues is generating $1.1 million, which uh, you know, reduces the, the nut of the 3.7. Then we talk about um, the next item here, the Water Infrastructure Investment Fund. And we've had this discussion in the past, and this is the ability under recent legislation to allow a property tax surcharge onto your uh, tax rate, similar to what we do with the CPA surcharge. They're separate and distinct. Uh, just because you would raise a water infrastructure fund doesn't mean you have to change your CPA tax surcharge. However, uh, understanding the sensitivities in Yarmouth about not having any overall impact on the tax rate, you know, we understand that likely a rise in one might result in a decrease in the other. And to that point, I've uh, spoken with the CPC chairman, Gary, Ella, um, Gary uh, on a few t occasions, as well as being in front of that committee to discuss this concept with them. So they, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say they're on board, but they've been informed, and I'm sure they'll have their um, comments to you uh, on how they think they could proceed. Um, for our projections here, we used a 1.5% uh, wastewater investment an infrastructure fund surcharge, uh, water infrastructure and investment fund surcharge. Uh, based on our prior discussions, I would contemplate that would be matched by a reduction in the CPA surcharge. So no overall net change in the tax impact to the property tax owner, uh, property taxpayers, but we'd be generating, repurposing the overall surcharge strictly for wastewater purposes, and that would generate a little over a million dollars a year towards our $3.7 million debt service. We have the next line is the uh, third line down, 695000 is dedicated local receipts. So as you're all aware, um, there is a new short-term rental tax legislation that became effective July 1, and now all, for example, Airbnb, all short-term rentals other than just the hotels and motels are subject to the short-term rental tax, 6% of which Yarmouth charges. Uh, so we have some projections, um, a low of which is around 285 or so. A high is a little over uh, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars. We have the mid-range estimate of what that new legislation might generate, or about 570,000 dollars. And of course, uh, 
I should have pointed out that we're going from this top line of relatively high level of certainty as to what these things are. The wastewater inf infrastructure fund is a high level of certainty of what we're going to generate on that, but a low level of certainty to actually implement that, a lower, I should say. Whereas this dedicated lo local receipts, the short term rental tax of $570,000, we don't know yet what we've collected on that. And so we're a little bit ways out to be able to say how great that estimate of 570 is. But we did use the midpoint of the potential range. In addition to that 570,000, we do have some uh, solar uh, PV projects over at 50 Workshop Road and on our recently on our fire stations, which have, um, are completed. Uh, Workshop Road is to be completed within the next year. And we're hoping to realize upwards of $125,000 of savings related to those projects. And the goal here would be through the budget process to, process is to repurpose those savings or direct cash, such as they may be from these projects, um, to go towards wastewater. I should reiterate, um, just to be clear on the short-term rental tax, that would contemplate that we're making a conscious decision to dedicate 100% of the short-term rental tax new revenue uh, to wastewater financing. And then finally, uh, the least um, certain of all these elements, um, because it's just uh, evolving, the other piece of that uh, legislation that recently passed, that not only do we tax all short-term rentals now, but we also have a new 2.75% tax on short-term rentals that go to the Cape and Islands Water Protection Trust, of which uh, uh, Tracy Post of the board is our representative, and they've had two meetings to date. And so the mechanics of how funds that go into this trust, uh, roughly around $18 million per year currently estimated, estimated uh, has to be determined on how to equitably return it to each community. Um, my discussions with my uh, colleagues and other uh, people that have done some estimates in other towns, uh, particularly Orleans, who I uh, reviewed, Alan McClellan, a, a former selectman in Orleans, did his presentation to the uh, One Cape Summit yesterday. And I was happy to hear, and he was involved in the legislative process and some of the sausage making that goes along with that. And he agrees with our 25% uh, as a planning estimate. Um, so we've used that 25%, uh, when I say 25%, 25% of our project cost. Um, we have some estimates based on our short-term rental calculations that we'd be generating a little over almost $1.6 million a year of revenue, not from our taxpayers per se, but from Yarmouth properties that would be going into the trust. I guess they are our taxpayers, but it's not, uh, it's from the <laughs> visitors, so to speak. Um, so that's the least certain because uh, we don't even know the process that's going to be used for distribution of these uh, funds yet. Um, we have some ideas of what we think we'd like to see that would help us to realize that level of 25%, and so we're going to have to work through that process. And of course, we have to ultimately see what the collections are and uh, ensure that everybody that's currently in the trust remains in the trust. Uh, one of the elements uh, that goes into this is there is an option to withdraw after a year. And people have talked about that, uh, of withdrawing and replacing it with a up to 100% local impact fee. And so that's a possibility. Uh, and up until recently, that was a difficult proposition because the state was not going to administer it. You'd have to do that y yourself, administer it, collect it yourself. But the state has recently said that they would do that on our behalf. So that becomes a, perhaps a more attractive option. And so we got to see how the, all this plays out. But the whole point of all this is, based on those uh, four generalized areas of funding, uh, we can generate $3.8 million of all these estimates come to fruition, which is about $72,000 more than our estimated or projected debt service, which is generating a surplus each year. Um, in addition, some of these sources would be available to us. Uh, this debt service isn't projected to start until 2025. Um, there might be some small, smaller interest costs on a short-term bonds between 2022 to 2025, but relatively negligible. But the major debt service would start in 2025. So we have an opportunity, if we implement some of these now, to pre-fund our program. And so the combination of uh, that $72,000, some pre-funding, and some other levers that we might be able to um, pull uh, to make this work uh, could help backstop 
this plan in the extent that you run short in any particular year. And I don't think I, it didn't fit nicely on a slide and it was very detailed, but in your uh, agenda and packets that I had, materials that I had sent out to you, included a spreadsheet that indicated the annual uh, surpluses being generated by this type of plan and the cumulative amounts that build up. And so we're pretty confident that this can do that. And here's the pie chart showing basically 25% um, coming from the Water Protection Trust, 29% uh, coming from user generated revenues, 16% coming from the local receipts, and about 28% from the Water Infrastructure Fund. So back in the Water Resource Advisory Committee started its work. It talked about some cost principles, that those that use the system should pay more, but that everybody ought to pay some, and this kind of meets all of that over the overarching principle of let's not hit the tax rate, the general operating tax rate, if possible. Uh, so we think we've identified a path. Now we've got to work to make sure that we can achieve that path. Um, we have some things that could backstop this. Um, we talked about the pre-funding. We talked about um, being able to move the various co elements up and down if, uh, if on one area if they don't come to fruition in another. Um, we are contemplating a combined water resource enterprise fund that would uh, allow the carrying over of these surpluses. And perhaps when we talk about the water rate, um, for example, uh, Factoring some of our capital needs into this, that as well to help prefund our plan. Um, when I went in front of the finance committee to brief them on our progress and to tell them where we stood uh, with uh, various aspects of the program, uh, particularly the cost recovery, they expressed an interest of how can you backstop this plan in case some of these estimates don't come through. And so we talked about. Um, I know. I know there's some discussion as to. Does debt drop-off represent tax rate impact? Um, I'm not here to have that discussion tonight, but that could be perhaps a way to backstop uh, some of these estimates not being actualized. Uh, we haven't considered any of the new growth that we do expect to have a, at least over a million dollars in the first you know, five to seven years of having a wastewater plan proposed and constructed of uh, new commercial growth that would help add to our um, property tax base, and we could dedicate through a financial management policy some of that new growth to help backstop the plan. Uh, and also, we haven't been able to apply for a lot of grant and opportunities because basically we don't have a shovel-ready project. Uh, if we get this moving forward and we, as we start to um, do the design and head towards construction, we have the ability to apply for grants, and we'd also have the ability to, uh, through the SRF program, apply for a subsidy of up to 10%. And, uh, and a couple of other communities that I've looked at that have funding plans, uh, conversely, very similar to what I have put together and been working on. Um, they, are, uh, they are assuming a 10% subsidy. Uh, we didn't go that far. Um, we're hoping to get one, but we're not presuming that. But if it comes to fruition, that helps to backstop some of these things that we have laid out. Um, there is a lot of details that go into <coughs> executing this and even more that goes into backstopping all this, uh, which we'll save for future discussions uh, unless you have specific questions that you want to get into now on it. But um, with that, I'll leave it there, and um, I'm sure we have a lot of things we can discuss with your questions. Good. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your fine presentation. Norm, do you have questions? I do have a few. Thanks again, Rich. Uh, um, I appreciate the efforts to avoid any uh, general tax increase, uh, and uh, um, it seems like we have a few backstops as well. Uh, hopefully, we can work on some of those to get them active. Uh, you know, I, I know some of the planning that would go into a transfer tax would take take a while to implement. So, you know, if that's something that we can investigate, uh, um, maybe it'll provide some. Um, uh, pre-funding for some of the other other uh, phases, or maybe it would provide some options uh, to move ahead with other phases more more quickly than we might have planned. Um, but um, some specific questions. Um, 
and um, one is first of all I you know we heard presentations on the capital cost and uh, the distribution costs uh, um, or collection costs <clears throat> and the statement has been made uh, a number of times and uh, that we're not going to save an awful lot of money on capital, but we're going to save money on the operating costs. And I, every time I've heard that, I've said, oh, wait a minute, uh, we're building this big facility and sharing it with Dennis and Harwich, and we don't realize any capital cost savings. Why is that? I mean, it just doesn't, just doesn't seem to make sense that if three communities combine their efforts in a capital facility that uh, we wouldn't save any money. Um, so I have some comments, but I know Dave has had this question several times. I'll let Dave Young handle that one. A uh, very good question, uh, Selectman Holcomb. Um, it was in the cost tables that you have in that memo that was presented. Um, be happy to go through it with you at any point. Um, but what the savings is, is you are saving on your treatment plan by being part of the three-town partnership. Uh, what it does, though, is it costs you more to convey your wastewater over to Dennis because you're no longer just conveying it internally within Yarmouth. So you have that extra cost to convey over to the Dennis, the site in Dennis, which is where the treatment plant would be located at their DPW site, um, and then the cost of conveying to the multiple effluent recharge sites. So that offsets it's almost a wash, um, the, your savings of over $20 million in the treatment plant versus if you were building it on your own. As Rich alluded to, your big savings is in the annual operating cost at the treatment plant. Instead okay. of operating a treatment plant on your own, you're paying about half. I'm, I'm trying to envision where the conveyance is and, and, um, and the uh, difference between the um, you know the conveyance that would exist going to Dennis and going to Buck Island, um, and you know how that all pulls together. I, I, and, you know, it's what what you're saying is running the pipe from say the this side of the Bass River Bridge over the bridge and and up to the uh, Dennis site would offset any savings that we might uh, uh, get from sharing capital cost of the treatment plant. Um, is, is Dennis going to have any, any um, piping in that same area? Uh, Dave, if I just might jump in just for a second. Sure. Let me just, because I've had this question myself quite a bit, I mean, I just want to frame it first. Um, so remember, what we're talking about is a phase one collection system. The 112 million, which is we're hoping the high end of what we're talking about, is for a Yarmouth only solution. So we're hoping, uh, so what you're talking about is a very specific discussion that we'll be having in the couple months of, in the, in the coming months of, should we do something other than the Yarmouth only solution and consider a regional partnership with DHY? Presumably because there's gonna be savings that Dave and this working group, the HY working group, will be presenting to all of its participants as to why there's savings. Now, one savings might be more than another for the various reasons, but also I would submit that we haven't decided or agreed upon our final document yet either. So I would submit to you that all these are great questions that we're gonna have to talk about, uh, but we're hoping that the high end uh, cost is the 112 million and if we come in at something less because we can do something different, it's all okay. the better. Fair enough. I mean, you know, we could defer the, those questions to the future, but uh, I think you get the drift of what I'm saying is really, you know, getting down to some specifics about, you know, what are the the um, conveyance costs that are that are offsetting the capital savings, and what in fact are the capital savings? Because uh, I think what you're saying is there are capital savings. Uh, but that the conveyance costs uh, are, are um, offsetting that. And I, I'd kind of like to understand some specifics about that so that we uh, can explain it. Sure. Um, well, are you talking about operating or capital? The uh, second question I had is about on the user-generated revenue. Um, there's 
the 25% capital surcharge and a 20% of uh, a betterment uh, charge. Um, so uh, when you say 25%, is that 25% of the uh, operating charge that uh, uh, a user gets for you know, what, whatever affluent they're discharging? So, uh, correct. Uh, so, for example, uh, not similar to a water rate, right? So uh, we have a water rate that covers a base of costs, operating and capital costs. So we are projecting uh, in this phase one, um, and again, the devil's in the details of how you work this out, but we're hoping to recover $2.5 million of operating costs out of this phase one, a portion among all the users. And so what does that look like? And so if you, and I'll just use nice round numbers for ease of discussion here, but if you had a cost of uh, $1,000 over the course of a year for a sewer rate, because you have a certain amount of flow, we would add 25% or $250 onto your operating bill as a okay. capital surcharge that okay. would go just to pay for this debt service. And so 25% of the 2.5 million total applied to everybody, portioned to everybody, is $625,000. Okay, I mean, how were those numbers arrived at? Is that, uh, is that I mean, do we, Compared that to other communities, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is the basis for that? Is there any opportunity there for increasing those amounts? Absolutely. Um, it's a percentage, so it would increase right. if the rates are increased. Um, I think, and I don't have the exact number, but I think our uh, uh, it was a number that was derived from our work with our consultant and doing the capital, but also what's the operating costs look like. And I think we were looking at more like a little over $3 million for operating costs. I used a conservative number, a low end of that estimate, just for conservative sake, um, of the 2.5. Okay. Um, well, my question was really you know, related to, you know, is the 25, is it, should that be 50 percent? So again, that goes to my point of uh, the challenge in all of this. So we have a concept of how we think we can get there without hitting the tax rate. Okay. Now we got to make that happen. And so to the extent it doesn't happen in one of the areas, we might have to adjust one of the others, and that might be one of the areas either okay. on a increased you're not, saying, you're not saying this is set in stone. It's, it's a matter of, uh, in other words, the rate structure is not set in stone. It's a matter of uh, practicality in terms of uh, what the what the revenue stream looks like compared to what the cost is. Right. So you know, I get the charge from the Water Resource Advisory Committee. who get their charge from you and from the public when we did a you know, for example, over the cultural center. You know, the big fly in the ointment is how are we going to pay for this, and nobody wants right. to hit it on their tax rate. Right. So, what's a plan that does it without hitting it on the tax rate? And so these are the elements that we came up and cobbled together to get to that point. Now, okay. do we have, so here's where we are, and with your direction, this would be the path that we would pursue, and we will have to tweak it when we get, you know, uh, the reality of what some of these things may or may not be. Okay. I, I think, I, I understand now at this point. Uh, so, um, the economic uh, growth potential that is, you know, that's always thrown out is, well, you know, we're... If we if we do this, we'll expect some economic growth from from it. Do we do we have um, evidence from other communities that have uh, done similar uh, installations that uh, demonstrate some sort of economic growth? So that's a uh, the actual data that you would probably want. You right. We're fellow accountants, so I understand how you're thinking. That's right. Show um, me the data. <laughs> um, I'm working on getting that. Okay. We have plenty of anecdotal evidence, uh, with lots of communities, um, and some of them local, that will be pursuing. The, and I don't know that they'll have quote scientific data. Study. But yeah. we will have pre-construction and post-construction for a number of years, and we can look to that. The problem is in that 
is what's the economic climate during that period. You got to take that into consideration. Right. Right? Yeah, so are you starting from 2008 where things were really low to 2015 where you've gone through a cycle of quite a bit of a uptick? Mm -hmm. Or are you starting in 2000 when things are also high and going to 2008 when you had a huge decline? So it's not easy. Um, and you're also dealing with communities that have significantly more year over year, more new growth than the town of Yarmouth. Town of Yarmouth, and you've probably heard me say this, has amongst the lowest new growth factor right. on the Cape. Of point, so our new growth is, I've said it so much now I think I forgot it, is 0.67 or 0.67 percent I believe it is on average over the last 10 years. Towns of Barnstable, Mashpee, Sandwich, Falmouth, any comparable you want to come up with are uh, double or more than what Yarmouth's new growth rate is. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the, the, the comment of how can these other towns fund their school districts within the prop two and a half levy, the answer is they didn't really do it within, within two and a half percent because right. they got the two and a half percent new growth uh, yeah. add on to the levy and one and a half percent new growth. Mm -hmm. So they've done it with four percent. Right. Yarmouth has done it with the two and a half percent and the point seven percent. Mm -hmm. We've done it with 3.2. Right. So you it's know, not an e equal comparison. And there is evidence of the, of the three towns of what we're mimicking in the DHY agreement that they've had substantial growth, uh, new growth, because of the wastewater that they implemented up in those towns. Okay. And I would also offer... That was in part of the, st the st uh, study from UMass. Okay. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I think, you know, it would be nice to see some of that information. And, you know, I'm sure there's there's got to be other... Uh, you know, demonstrated projects around uh, New England that uh, certainly I would think where where it would be uh, pretty easy to find out, you know, what what the communities think uh, uh, has been uh, shown for economic development. So, um, so I, you know, I just think I think it's important to get some credible evidence backing that that claim up so uh, i think it's important i you take for granted that uh, you and i are having a you're, you're asking questions i'm providing an answer but there's a public out there that's watching on tv and or might right. get the information and so i would be remiss if i didn't mention that we did have as uh kurt has pointed out a study commissioned by the uh, donahue institute through umass and uh that report cites that there's a pent current pent-up demand of over $100 million in the town of Yarmouth today. Mm -hmm. And I've done the math, and that roughly equates to about a million dollars of new property tax growth that would be added onto our property tax base. Um, so there's that. We think that actually is a conservative estimate. Mm -hmm. It could be more. Uh, but the question is timing. When does it happen? And so that also reminds me of a question that Suckman Post had uh, a month or two ago about is there anything we could do now and so I pose, you know, to help our businesses that are trying to expand but are constrained by the current constraints of having on-site treatment and monitoring and, and all that good stuff. And so I pose that question to Dave Young at CDM because of his experience with multiple communities. And the response was um, to have a plan and have some indication that um, you're following through on that. And Dave has an experience, anecdotal experience to that point in many communities. And I don't know, Dave, if you could speak to that. Well, you know, Kurt just mentioned the uh, Mansfield, Foxborough, and Norton. Town of Norton has exploded with economic development now that they have sufficient wastewater capacity. You know, being right on the Route 495, Route 123 belt, um, Mansfield has experienced a lot, particularly in the downtown near the train station. Uh, in Foxborough, their whole downtown now is, um, they just leased out the old fire station site and several other areas there, now that they have sufficient wastewater capacity. So as written up in the Donahue uh, Institute economic study done for Yarmouth, um, I think they quote the number for every dollar of infrastructure invested, you get $15 in return and private economic benefit coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so there's three towns who have been through it. Uh, they were all under um, administrative orders, couldn't connect in anymore uh, for a while. They were already at their limits in their agreements. Once that broke free, the economic benefit has been tremendous. Now some would say it's been tremendous everywhere, mm -hmm. but clearly those facility, those communities would not have had that growth if they didn't have the wastewater capacity. I would Let add me, uh, real quick on that, just to add one more town. I was invited to visit Easton, Mass, uh, the other day, 
and they had a, a different approach. They had um, some dilapidated buildings in their downtown that as part of um, the wastewater problem could not be uh, repurposed or anything, and they had historic value. So they actually entered into a uh, like a public-private partnership to put a package treatment plant there. It's doing 150,000 gallons a day. In that downtown block, since that plant went in, has just come alive with restaurants and storefronts because having the wastewater solution manageable, and in this particular case it was a different model, it was public-private partnership, where the town now will now have ownership of that package plant at some point, but it's brought that whole corridor to life. It's right across from Town Hall. It's something to see to what, what, the, what it was like, list, listen to the selectmen before that, they didn't even have a, a prayer as to what would be the future there until this partnership arrived with that plant. So um, right in close proximity to us, we have some living incubators. Now that's particularly interesting to us because of the package treatment of it in a very localized area where a wide scale central plant wasn't really a viable option. Mm -hmm. So there's ideas out there. Well, that's actually a good point, Dan, because uh, the other portion of Easton is actually tying into the MFN that's plant. That's correct, correct. Um, and that's where the other economic development area, village center, so to speak, uh, for smart growth has been encouraged. So they're using multiple means to address that issue. I would also just add, uh, we've done quite a bit of outreach, and I didn't take the time to go through all of it, um, but a lot of uh, individuals, a lot of community groups, um, a lot of commercial ventures, and... Dave's point to me when I asked him the question rings true. Um, if they only knew, they don't need to know that wastewater is coming in tomorrow, but if they know that it's coming in three to five years, it takes them time to ramp up and get their plans. Absent that, they can't even get off the dime. And so they want to know what are we going to do or not, because if it's not, then to Dan's point, we have other options to pursue that might be feasible and viable, but maybe not as attractive or as effective or cost efficient as what we're proposing with this. And some of the new growth numbers for Yarmouth are actually based on conversations with commercial property owners in this town. So they didn't just pull mm -hmm. it out of the sky. They talked to various people and got a sense of what they have in mind if they have wastewater available, uh, what did redevelopment could be. Okay. Yeah, it might provide some opportunities for redevelopment of, a, of an old school building like Mattakees or something. Never know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Mark. Um, <coughs> before I go into my questions, I'm wondering, Rich, if you could just uh, do me a favor and introduce or at least acknowledge all the Water Resources Advisory Committee members yeah, that have shown up tonight. Thank, I, thank you. Um, so, Spiro. Mr. Mr. Koskis uh, is our uh, at-large member. Tom Roach and Tom Durkin in the back row. Um, our newest member, uh, George. George Perkins. John and John DeLiza over here on the on the le my left. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have uh, all but one member here. It's a. Uh, uh, Rennie is the only one uh, not here. Rennie Hammond's Hammond. not here, yeah. Thank you. I want to thank the members that have been then been working on this. I want to thank you all for your, your time and your energy and your effort. Um, I know that the, you've had a lot of meetings, you've had a lot of discussions, and I very much appreciate, uh, as I'm sure everybody here in the board does, all your hard work on so behalf of the town. Tom Roach uh, was our moderator of our cultural center event on June 24th. We had, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 people. Uh, up, you know, close to that amount, uh, c come out to hear about our plans. Uh, Tom, uh, no, I'm sorry, John uh, will be helping moderate uh, an event in August, uh, a Yarmouth type event at the Realtors Association. We have an event planned in September at uh, Flax Pond and a public outreach session in October just before a potential town meeting uh, at the Senior Center planned. Um, I'm just curious, what's what's sort of been the reaction in some of the public meetings in terms of this basic presentation? What kind of feedback are we getting from some of the residents? By and large, I th we found everybody, mostly everybody, to be supportive. Obviously, there's some questions, and one right. uh, line of questioning in particular, why can't we just do um, 
IA system, innovative alternative systems? And the answer is um, you could, uh, but it doesn't achieve the level of nitrogen reduction that we have to achieve. So there's that. And there's still a tremendous cost to individual taxpayers to do that. So instead of connecting to a town or a municipal system and having it dealt with, individually, all 10,000, two-thirds of the town, 10,000 out of 15,000 households, would have to individually install, pay for their own IA treatment system on site, many of which are above ground or at least mounted. And so um, when I brought that point up, you know, we had a couple rep representatives from the Captain's Village area that said, well, that would be ridiculous if every property in Captain's Village had a above ground or mounted system on their small parcel, what kind of neighborhood would you be living in? And then we had one woman's like, well, I already smelling the septage from a, a nearby you know, IA system anyway, so I don't want to smell that. So um, although we welcome the question, um, the reality is they're not practical solutions to what we're facing. And as the DEP, DEP pointed out, uh, some of the systems that were suggested aren't even permitted in Massachusetts. And uh, we get the feedback that, well, they're permitted in other places. They, they could be permitted here. Well, s the application process to be permitted in other states might be simple, as simple as filling out an application and paying a fee. Whereas in Massachusetts, you've got to demonstrate that you are actually going to achieve results, and you've got to show that through testing. Let me make sure I understand in terms of the cost implications of this as well. This would be if indeed some households were going to move towards an innovative alternative, alternative septic system for their, you're saying that the, the, there would be the, the risk, since it doesn't totally meet um, the requirements that, that we're under, I mean it doesn't provide sufficient nitrogen removal. Um, isn't there also a, a huge monitoring cost associated that with as well? Right. So the would that be in borne by the town, or would it be by the individual? No. So that's the the crux of the argument. It'd be each individual property owner. So, you know, the economic development report indicated a cost of twenty thousand. We think it's probably closer to thirty thousand dollars for each of the ten thousand homeowners. So ten thousand times thirty thousand is you know three hundred million bucks. Got it. Um, so for the cost for the homeowner, okay. That Just so that I understand this, the there is a cost. But for the homeowner, if that's the direction that some might suggest might be more appropriate, what you're telling us is that that's a cost that's borne largely by the homeowner. It's a higher cost overall. So instead of having, so the way I had framed it, instead of having one overall community program and solution right. that we can all participate in, you've got 10,000 people doing their own thing and having to pay to monitor it uh, every each and every year for the length of time they own the so property. So the cost comparisons are just completely, dramatically different. Right. Yes. Yeah. Is that an electric, electrical cost as part of that? As well. And mm. past history has shown that if they don't have a consistent flow, they don't work as well as they're supposed to. And even at that best level, it's not enough nitrogen removal to get where we need to be. Now we have a question as to our seasonal nature here in town. If Got you it. have a, someone who's here just for a few months in the summer, uh, a couple months in the summer, uh, how is that system going to work in the winter? Got it. Um, there is also, th my understanding in terms of cost, we may be eligible for some degree of principal forgiveness. Is that correct? Right. So um, that was in one of my slides where I talked about things that we didn't include in our projection. Okay. And so that's the subsidy I was speaking to. So um, the SRF program has it's roughly a 10% debt forgiveness subsidy. Um, I didn't bank that into our projection. We hope we can get that through a one of, so although we might not save a lot of money on the capital by joining a regional solution or a regional plant, it certainly will give us extra points, so to speak, when we go to apply to the SRF program for a providing, for participating in a regional solution, which might make that project get 10% subsidy, or somewhere being zero and 10% subsidy. That's a significant number. Is it, isn't it sort of schedule driven? Don't we have to have our project move at a certain pace or be in the ground by a certain deadline in order to qualify for the that, or is there some other trigger mechanism I'll to be Dave eligible speak for speak to that? it, but by and large, this subsidy program is much, is a competitive process. Oh, it is. And they only have so much money. And so if we're competing with Orleans, Falmouth, Barnstable, 
sandwich, all doing projects at the same time, all wanting the 10% subsidy, there probably isn't sufficient money to go around to do that. If we're ahead of the curve, we have a better chance of getting it, and we're offering a regional approach, which gives us a, a leg up in the process. So, uh, Dave can. Yeah, the state revolving fund SRF loan program is the low interest loan program that's being discussed. Um, you have to do certain things in order to qualify for 0% interest loans. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to line you up to make sure you're doing all five of those things. Uh, in addition to that, um, the state is required to put a certain amount of money into a principal forgiveness bucket on an annual basis. And that changes every year, that amount. Depends on how much money they're getting from the federal government. Uh, depends on how many communities in different tier levels. There are three tiers. I believe you're tier two off of a very complex formula, but really driven off per capita incomes. Um, this year, uh, I think that tier two was 3.3%. It's projected next year to go to the 9.9, .9, which is the 10% that Rich is quoting. The year after that, who knows? Okay. Um, so that's why we haven't factored that in, but clearly we're trying to line you up to make sure whatever that number is at the time that you would qualify, um, that you would receive it. Thank you. Um, you said that our cost recovery plan, or at least the, what you've laid out, is similar to what we've seen in other towns. Is it true that Orleans, because I, I, I've been following what's been going on in Orleans, and I know they developed a cost recovery plan that received, I think, support from... Yeah, and the driving the force behind the Orleans plan was Alan McClellan, who was a Sluckman at the time, mm -hmm. and had a similar uh, concern in that town. Um, and actually, I'm going to meet with Alan, and we're going to compare notes uh, and concerns and you know, implementation concerns, things like that. But their debt spiked. They hadn't done any capital infrastructure for a number of years, and all of a sudden, they have a DPW facility. They have a police department. They are working towards the fire department. They got wastewater. They got natural resource building. They have all kinds of things. They have Nosset Beach re restoration. So their debt has grown dramatically and is projected to continue to grow dramatically. And so their concern was, how do you do this without spiking the tax rate? And so um, they actually have been doing this over the last eight years. Uh, they had some significant community opposition, and so they actually had to have mediators come in, and they grew uh, together consensus groups so that they're all working from the same information. And one of the things that came out of that was all these, they could all agree on these certain things, mm -hmm. same concepts that we're talking about. Those that use it should pay more, but everybody ought to pay something. But what's the fair and equitable distribution of all that? And so what they ended up with is a plan that's pretty much similar to ours, except I think ours is a little more concrete. So. I One it. thing I'll add, because I, uh, I had a conversation on that topic with a selectman from Orleans the other night. And one of the things that uh, he, he brought, which is a similar scenario that's going to happen here, is because uh, I always thought it was impressive that before they even built the plant, they put pipes in the ground with their Route 28 construction project up there. We're facing the same situation. So I asked him about how it was that that was received. He said it went once we had the plan, and one of their big area concerns was effluent recharge, where that site was going to be. But he said once you explain it to folks to say, hey, look, the state's going to come in with this reconstruction project, we need to go down this road, and that's where the mediation piece was helpful because everybody could agree to these common points. It made it an easier sell to go to town meeting to get the money needed to interface with DOT to get those pipes in the ground because it's essentially, you know, with some skeptics that you have today about government, what are you doing putting pipes in the ground and not connecting to anything? Well, in this particular case, to Rich's point, they had covered all those bases, got the common points done, and that was a great opportunity for them to save some money. So that was pretty impressive uh, level of due diligence on their part, and I thought that was a lesson probably pretty well learned for our squad, too. So to that point, remember, we're talking the hopefully the high end of $112 million. Uh, we do have an opportunity there. Um, and Jeff Colby has the, the details. He's working this every day with the state DOT as to at minimum at least four uh, Route 28 road work projects throughout Yarmouth. And so the big problem, so the first issue is if you can do your work and plan it in co co uh, coronation with the DOT, you can save money because they're covering paving costs and you're just paying some incremental costs for what you need to do. But the bigger issue is once the state comes through and does their project on Route 28, there's a five-year moratorium on digging up that road again. Mm -hmm. And so these four projects are phased out over the next several years. And so if we're not acting now, we are in danger of not being able to do our phase one as we currently contemplate it for 
until the year 2030. And so we're talking in another 10 years. And uh, as Dave Young has mentioned to you before and to our committee, uh, if we had done this in 2011, you know, roughly another, you know, 10 years, because we're projecting costs out to 2022 in this phase, so roughly a 10-year increment uh, would have paid for our cost of our current phase one that we're proposing. So it's saving money on the costs from the state road work is important, but the inflation, I can't, can't find enough revenue sources to offset that increased inflation. It's, it's a no, big I appreciate amount. that. My, my last comment is um, with respect to the fact that there are things that are being done by the town of Yarmouth or in conjunction with others that have helped mitigate or address the problem. You mentioned the Parkers River Bridge. Obviously, I believe Bass River Bridge improvements will uh, provide some degree of mitigation. And I believe the replacement of the railroad bridge with the, with the bike trail bridge has had some uh, mitigation. Um, and should the state advance the, uh, the, the, the work on Route 6 that goes over Bass River, that could also provide some mitigation. Is there any way to sort of quantify any of that to sort of suggest where it would or monetize it in some way to say from a dollar figure point of view that these projects represent some savings to us financially or is it is that not achievable? Uh, no, we have actually done those cost projections for each of those. I don't have those memos okay. with me tonight, but uh, it was, it's several million dollars. Uh, the question is, um, you know, the, big, right. the big opening that would make the largest benefit would be the Route 6 bridge widening. Got it. And right now, MassDOT doesn't have that on their radar screen, so we need to find a way to get that on their planning horizon, whether it's 10 years or 20 years out. Uh, but that would be the biggest benefit of the three <laughs> you just mentioned. Right. Well, remember, um, a big part of this, we've got this eight-phase plan, and that's why I always got to keep people back to phase one. Right. Well, however we do phase eight, never mind phase two, is going to be different. How we finance it, how we go about it, the cost elements. Phase one is largely a commercial phase, we would expect that the commercial entities are paying for the hookups. So one of the questions, we, some of the feedback we get from the outreach sessions is how much is my hookup going to be? And if you're a residential property in phase two, three, or four, or a future phase, I, I don't really know the answer. But I can tell you that in the past, when I've been working on this since 2015, we've contemplated rolling those hookup costs for residential customers into our financing plan. So it could be zero. But we don't know because we're not focusing on how do we cover costs for phase four yet. Um, but the larger point to your question, uh, you know, a lot of effort is being paid to natural uh, remediation, whether it's bridge widening and flushing, yeah. dredging, shell fishing, um, cranberry bogs, uh, other developments in IA technologies. As those things, so the term we use is adaptive management. So as we do, if we complete a phase one and we monitor the results and what's the impacts that's having, and as new technologies and ability to do different things become available to us, we're going to change what we do in phase five, six, seven, and eight. It's not going to look like we have it on the map today. We're hoping overall to shrink that. What the, the areas that are shaded on those maps represent the current nitrogen sensitive areas. If we can shrink that, then we're going to save costs. And I don't, I can't bake that into any projection today because we don't know how that's going to play out. But when it does, we'll be sure to, to do that. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, uh, Dave. Um, David, on uh, Route 6, the bridge, did I hear you say something about uh, uh, the, the replacement of that would have a positive impact? Uh, well, what we're asking for them to consider is when they go to replace it, since it's over 50 years old, uh, that they widen it so that you okay. have a wider area. Uh, there are other studies need to be done to, you know, look at any impacts upstream from the widening and all, but the preliminary modeling of it shows a significant improvement because it's, that's the bottleneck in the Bass River. I, you know, um Two months ago, I had that conversation with DOT at the Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting, and they denied that there was any positive impact to be shown 
from reconstruction of that bridge, and they, they're saying it's not on the radar screen for a very long time as one of the bridges that needs replacement. And I asked for specific follow-up information. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, and I don't have any data, uh, that it would be a benefit. And they're saying, no, 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 no. Uh, so that's, that's not the case. Yeah, no, there are memos I mean, We need to get some clarity in. around what the facts are on this, I think. Well, even, even Route 28, Bass River Bridge, they claim is going to show some improved flushing just because there's less pilings in the ground. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I haven't experienced it myself, but those who boat out to Mayfair say that whole highway bounces because half the pilings aren't even touching the bottom anymore. Right. So it's mm. amazing that they think uh, it's going to last 20 years. Yeah. So a matter of perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing is that Dennis is responsible for dredging the upper end of the river. I found mm -hmm. One of the things I found out in this whole exercise is Yamath does the south end of the river, Dennis does the north end of the river as far as permitting and getting all that done. So they've been kind of behind the eight ball because they've been focused on Sasuit. So uh, they need to do some work on the northern reaches of the river because even the railroad bridge has already th changed the shoaling in the river in the upper reaches. So okay. that's another issue that has to be uh, well, handled yeah. also. But in a matter of comparison, uh, Park Azure, I just confirmed with Jeff, much narrower bridge opening uh, was being expanded from 18 feet to 30 feet. And remember, in our preliminary projections on these nitrogen removal maps, Parker's River has a 96% nitrogen removal requirement. Mm -hmm. And that 18 to 30 foot widening is projected to bring that down to about 70%. Okay. So I'll, you know, I'm no scientist, but you know. Well, I know, but that's Parker's River. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, I, I can't very well, uh, you know, go back to DOT and, and talk with them about um, Parker's River. I mean, that's, that's just, anecdotal evidence uh, you know we need is specific information with regard to the route route six bridge and 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 what uh some demonstrated uh tests that would uh show what the improvement would be uh, no the three towns dennis harwich and yarmouth have sent letters to the mass department of transportation asking for a meeting to discuss it uh, included a memo projecting the benefits included a memo projecting the cost savings, and the response letter back was, it's not on our radar screen. Well, yeah, the same response I've got, but I, I'll be happy to follow up on it, but it would be nice if I had some, some data uh, to provide to them as well, and I'd be happy to do that in a, in a, in a meeting with them. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, the only way that I can uh, exert any influence with that is to, to present uh, data so that they can't just say, well, you know, our our information shows that there's no benefit. Because that, that's I'd be what happy to get you that memo and resend. Yeah, one of, one of the things that we've talked about in the DHY group is, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, here, but I think the last estimate I heard on that set of bridges was $65 million or something in that neighborhood. So one of the things that DOT doesn't respond to well is when you put in a request and you don't say you're going to be a partner with them on things. As bad as they are on a lot of things when you're paying the full boat they're even worse when you're not offering a pay so one of the things the three towns and the group have talked about is approaching them at an appropriate time they've got a few things on their plate right now but at an appropriate time when we know what the better projection would be and what the savings would be like in the parkers river basin and in that area i mean that reduction in percentage is actually saving us a quantifiable sum of money so we have a little bit of work to do there but but approach it from a wastewater treatment concept which is we'll be a partner in a future bridge project because we believe it will save us some sum of money we just have to quantify that before we go back mm -hmm. into a room and ask them yeah. and i and i think if you go in with that approach you'll have better success getting them to uh, move towards working with you to get it on the screen to to do something about but the reality is it's so old and we have documented its condition that uh, when they're ready to move on it you know we want to be ready to say we can be a partner with it you know yeah. I think we should lobby the and I know we've had this discussion we're getting off topic but we should lobby the rest of the Cape Towns to join us not just the three towns that bridge 
if it's not fixed or repaired, something happened, could, they'd all be in trouble. Could really um, <coughs> impact the economy and safety. No question. That is how the Lower Cape people get to the hospital. Yeah. If if that if something happens to that bridge, it, we've had the conversation here with the reporters to go underneath that thing <coughs> to they, to hear have. that and it's still not on their we the know radar the the is amazing. <laughs> And we right. just did their other bridge and it didn't cost them a dime, so they can transfer that savings to the other one. And, and that takes time to put that ass together, and that's certainly something that we'll bring back to the DHY group. And, uh, and, and you know, there's a number of agenda topics that we discuss. We bring in the delegation. We've done it a couple of times, and probably that's a good good one for the next time to bring them in and say, look, you know, this bridge is important. These set of bridges are important for all of you. You know, you need to be partners in this concept, you know. I just want to ask what you need from us next steps because um, we've had the ability, you had a great presentation at the Cultural Center, so um, some of us were there, we've already had the ability to watch this. I think that a lot of these things we need to get moving on, so in terms of our support or next steps, what is it that you're looking for? So uh, we'll be formalizing that in the next coming weeks, but uh, on a high level, um, the DHY working group uh, is, has done its work and is meeting, continuing to meet to flush out exactly what it's going to want as far as the timeline. Uh, so presumably the legislation will be passed in the next few weeks. We'll have an operating agreement that we'll need to discuss and that'll have to be in front of uh, town meeting uh, if it needs your approval and town meeting approval. Uh, so that's an item. Uh, if you're inclined to take any action at the upcoming special town meeting or an annual meeting regarding uh, dedication of the short-term rental tax is a step we could take. The creation of a water infrastructure fund is a step we could take. Uh, going to all these elements that we just talked about, about the pre-funding is kind of an important concept uh, to help backstop everything that we're talking about. Yeah, and also I think, um I'm not, I'm not sure what steps you need from this board in terms of aligning ourselves with those mass DOT projects, but have you been able to quantify the savings of, of piggybacking on those projects? I mean, I know asphalt's extremely expensive, but just in general, doing it at the same time is, what would you consider the percentage of savings if we um, were able to piggyback on those projects? So CDM's actually working on refining some of those. They've given us an estimate I've been using just as a, um, I guess I, I wouldn't call it quite anecdotal, but um, my estimates of about $3 million, and I've asked CDM to quantify in hard numbers exactly what that savings, how, it, what, how that gets represented. Do we know the timeline in terms of when that first project is, is going to be and if we're going to be able to even be in a position to take advantage of it? Yeah, we have a figure that has all the uh, MassDOT projects sequenced from Barnstable to through Harwich, Barnstable being the Yarmouth Road intersection at 28. Um, so we're trying to get those all lined up and dovetailed, but some of them have already slipped significantly because of the funding being held back or one of the projects, the costs went up. So we're in the process of trying to update that now, but clearly uh, we're working with town staff to um, make sure that you're ahead of the curve get the design plans for your pipe to MassDOT. It would be a MassDOT bid project. Um, so you even say get savings on that end as well. But in terms of construction, your real savings are the paving, the asphalt, uh, police details, implementation type issues like that. So we're in the process of trying to uh, fine tune the number that Rich just quoted to you. Oh, okay. The uh, and the existing schedule, I believe the first project was North Main Street and 28 and the Bathroom Bridge, but I believe they pushed the intersection out to go along with the bridge. That was the last I was told. So we have time. I think it was, this what, 2022 20, maybe? This is on our heels tomorrow that we no. need, we're, we're I think we bought another year with that particular project, but probably 2022 we want to be ready to go. Okay. I was going to ask about um, the additional hookup and pump costs. You kind of touched on it a little bit. We're not at that point. We can give numbers as far as what the cost to the homeowner might be in addition? Well, uh, phase one is largely commercial, a uh, little bit of residential. Um, so we, that might be something we can, on those small number of residentials, we might can create, create a program to account for that perhaps. But um, 
for phase one commercial entities, we would contemplate that they would pay for their hookups. That's, that's, that's all over the board as to what their requirements are, their needs are, where they're, whether they have an on-site system, you know, the configuration of the property. So um, the average hookup cost for residential is about 7000 um, bucks. But in prior planning that I've done, into the overall program costs for residential. And so when we get to phase, if we can ever get to phase two, I'll solve that, you know, we'll resolve that problem then. But you can't do a phase two unless you got a phase one. Right. And, um, and that's the other, one of the takeaways I got from yesterday going to the uh, One Cape Summit. Uh, I kept hearing it probably three different times from three different speakers that if you build out your cons commercial base, that will help uh, pave the way to finance the subsequent phases. Yeah, and I know you, you talked about our previous failure and the expense that it's um, it's driven up. Um, but I have to say, I'm, I think that this is something way more palatable for our residents. Um, and you know, I'm I'm happy with the progress that we've made and the plan that you put together. And I know you've worked really, really hard on this, Rich. You've met with all of us individually, so I just want to say how much we appreciate it to get to this point I think is huge. I, I, I have a hard time believing there'd be any um, real significant pushback. Uh, the last time the pushback really was was with the cost to the homeowners. So um, obviously it's a plan. As you said, it's adaptable. So um, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with this where it's not going to saddle on some of our homeowners. The, um, has the committee put any um, or had any conversation uh, around the zoning, the flow neutral zoning or w the timing of when that, who's going to be, is that in so the planning board's hands or? So we're got, starting to get into that stuff now um, and I'm in front of the, I think it's Conservation Commission Thursday, planning board the following week and the Board of Health a week after that. We're going to start discussing all these issues, and we're going to start presenting this plan to each of those committees so that they have an awareness, and we can start getting their feedback. But with that, we would anticipate, obviously, those que specific questions from those specific interests. So, I just like I said, I, I I think that was one of the other hesitations that we heard the last time around. So I just don't. I want to make sure we address that. Well, yeah, the other thing, it's not all just flow neutral either. There is there is growth allowed. With the SRF, but you kind of have to identify that right. up front. So you, you can't just down the road say, "Yeah, we're going to do whatever we want." Right. I think so the fear is. I know Karen is and Kathy and Dave. You sat with them, right? Working on these flow numbers to accommodate some development. Right, and I think we need the development, especially in our commercial areas, um, for that investment. Um, but I think the fear that a lot of people, especially that have been in communities off Cape that are more suburban, that have uh, wastewater, there's a whole lot more land area that um, you know gets built out. And I, I think that we're trying to make sure that we keep the Cape Cod that we love in the appropriate places and, and without people having the fear that it's going to be built out. Well, it, and it, at Open Cape this morning, they talked about the development through the decades and how much we've preserved as a cape, it's over 40% of the land is already, you know, unavailable for development. So a lot of what we have for open space will stay open space. I yeah, would be I have to be concerned that that's going to go away. I saw that number and I wondered if it was 40% of parcels or actual land area. I be took it as land area, but yeah. it could be. Okay. I mean, I think part of that's the air base and National Seashore probably yeah. make up a big chunk of that land. Uh, of course, we know in this town, we have over basically a third of our land or better put aside for municipal or I open space type uses. I just think it's more uses. than just that. I just think in neighborhoods mm -hmm. themselves, you know, the the land area that is utilized by septic systems then being transferred into buildings, I, I just think that that itself changes the character of a neighborhood. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, that's the intent of the so-called land use controls, which you referred to as flow neutrality. It's really managing to what the flow is that you put forth in your comprehensive wastewater management plan. And that's why in order to qualify for zero interest loans, uh, the state DEP wants to make sure you have a program in place where you're going to manage to that flow number so you don't get the uncontrolled growth. And local zoning still applies on top of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jerk. Uh, I've heard plenty for tonight. Thank you. All set. Um, just a couple of things. First, 
observation is I, I think your approach is, is correct. I think the last time this matter came before the town, people, I think people knew that there was a wastewater problem, and I think they knew that there had to be a solution, but they didn't want to. They were just afraid of runaway property taxes, and I think that's why they voted against it. So I, this approach should alleviate that concern. Um, and, and have people be more amenable. I, kn I know I was at the cultural center. Um, I know there's a few people that have um, this kind of self-determination philosophy. Why can't you make funds available? You know, we'll, we'll take care of our own property. We'll have our own solution. Um, but I don't think that represents what I heard in terms of most of the people. I think they were um, favorable to this kind of approach and probably more so with a regional approach if you could demonstrate to them that they were going to save money either on capital or operational costs or both. Um, the other thing is you talked about uh, betterments, 30-year betterments perhaps and charging a small percentage of interest. This um, uh, money that the state would make available uh, interest-free uh, are those repayment terms as long as 30 years because you I think you said the betterments you were going to be using a 30-year yeah the SRF program is extended it to a 30-year loan yeah. program and generally you would match your bet you know don't have to uh, I don't believe you have to but generally you match your betterment program to your debt service term as well and with the purpose of charging a low interest rate maybe a couple points would that be Kind of to subsidize the program to generate some uh, a little bit a little bit more uh, money to offset the cost, or would it mostly be uh, for administrative costs? I think the legislation, if you went straight by the book, uh, caps it at two percent over what you're paying. Uh, we probably would have to because of the what, how we want to do our program. Probably going to have to pursue special legislation so we can kind of write our own ticket, so to speak, as to how we do that. But generally, you're talking one or two percent above what you're paying. And that would generate a little bit of extra interest that goes into the zero rate. Loans. Right. So if we had a zero, the max of maybe two percent on those. Right. Okay. And would would the objective be more to defray administrative costs or to raise revenue? Uh, no, I'd say raising revenue <laughs> would be important, but um, so you know, there's a value the in getting a 30-year loan. So that would be the object of it. And if we can offer it, say at two percent, would still be a lot lower than a market rate loan. Okay. Um, Norman asked the question, why, why can't we save money on, on, on capital with this, with this project? And you, I think, answered it in terms of carrying the wastewater, t you know, over to the treatment plant in Dennis. Would, would that be going down 28 or design-wise, would it be going up to High Bank Road in, in that route? How would that? Uh, that's an excellent question. We're actually in the process of um, trying to fine-tune those costs. Uh, more as you know rich said you got one number out there we continue to try to refine that and lower it if we can uh, so we're currently looking at the option of instead of you pumping all the way over to a common pumping station as part of dhy uh, at route 134 and 28 um, at looking at going up high bank road and you go directly over yourself to the treatment plant um, we're just not there yet. We're in the process of trying to fine tune those, particularly uh, where the first uh, F1 recharge, large scale F1 recharge site, uh, potentially at the uh, Bass River Golf Course, you'd have pumping stations there anyway for the F1. So you got pipes coming back. So you might be able to take advantage of some cost savings by putting pipes in similar trenches. So it, it was. I, I I know you said there was two things, and I didn't really catch what you said. It was the was the other component of offsetting any um, um, savings on capital. The return of that water was that the other component. Yes, because you're going to. You, if you were doing your own, your sites are closer here, internal to Yarmouth, and you had two sites. As part of DHY, there are uh, six sites ultimately uh, in all three towns. So you're paying a portion of the piping to get to those six sites. Okay. But that's thank over the 40-year program. Okay, thank you. Well, does anyone else have any questions? All right, thank you very much for your presentation. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you to all the members of the committee. Thank you, Rich.
okay next item um we did the school thing so we're down to fall town meeting discussion for that i'll uh defer to mr dwelly he's been working on that but you got that item fall town meeting i think it's just to have so that item is to just tee up a, a general conversation this evening around where some of the core projects that i use better Topics for this type of town meeting. So I think tonight was geared more toward uh, is there a particular date uh, in mind that we're trying to target, and as well as is there anything else uh, at this point that the board feels uh, will be uh, critical to put on uh, put on that warrant. And the third was, and I don't think it's necessarily immediate at this point, but there's been um, conversation about what our fall town meeting looks like moving forward in the out years in terms of shifting uh, zoning and CPA articles and such uh, to away from spring into that. So that third piece is more of a kind of a broader conversation, but something as it relates to our town meeting. Well, I think in that memorandum of understanding that was signed today, if I'm not mistaken, we're supposed to coordinate and have identical dates. October 29th is what's been scheduled for. fall town meeting yeah. on the... Um, the school matter. <laughs> so that, that date said that on the That's uh that was a date that it's had uh I believe it's a Tuesday. Tuesday. You're not gonna be here? No. October twenty ninth. No, we're gonna be we're gonna be out west. Monday. October twenty ninth. What day would you do that? Monday? That's Tuesday. 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 So that'll be that. Um, so now you're looking for what other items other than that memorandum are we going to be discussing? You know, I have a, I have a question for you. you. And, and uh, we were looking at candidates for the finance committee, and there's seven people on the committee now. We reduced the number from nine to seven because we couldn't get enough people to serve. So now we have, I don't know what it is, uh, two or three people who want to stay on, but we have two really good new candidates, too. So we're in the potential position that, you know, we may have to replace people who have been sitting for a long time who want to stay or turn down the two good candidates. And I'm just wondering if we could put an article on and I haven't looked at I haven't looked at that part of the um, um, charter in a while. But if it limits it to seven, I wonder if we could change that to say a minimum of seven members in that way, because some of these people will probably be retiring in a year or two. And if we could, if we could have, let's say, a nine-member board temporarily, one or two of them leaves, the others, we still have the seven members. And I, you know, since we traditionally had nine members, how would that hurt to say a minimum of seven and then potentially we could have nine and then we could, you know, when we had attrition, we could automatically move those. We wouldn't have to do anything. Those other, we'd have seven. So the quorum numbers would not change? Right. It would be, still be seven, yeah. Based on seven. But, but you could add you could add additional members if you wanted to. Now I don't think this is going to be a, a regular problem because it's hard to get people. But but we have the unique situation where we have um, one one candidate who's a, a young uh, woman who's an attorney, and um, there's another um, fellow who was on the wastewater committee tonight that's got a doctor in economics, very very strong candidate. I think. Hate to say goodbye to him, and yet there's others that have served um, for quite a while who, who are desirous of remaining on. And I thought, well, maybe that would, um, you know, solve the problem a year or two. Other couple members move, you still have your seven. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm fine with it. I think, uh, you know, we we know that they're one of the committees that. Have an extreme time commitment and committed to other committees and if you can lessen the burden to them I think that that would be helpful and plus you know I think if you have skilled people it's only a benefit 
You know, I, I, I do too. And I, I, I actually just thought of this very recently. I haven't talked to um, the town moderator and the chairman of the FENCOM, but I know that everybody's in this kind of dilemma about it, and I'm just wondering if we couldn't just simply make that change. Dennis does it a lot more informally. I was watching in one of their meetings where I think they had a substance abuse committee and there was like, let's say, nine people, and I think the, their charter said seven. Mm. So they said, well, we have a, so do you want to make a motion that we, <laughs> we appoint them all? Sure. You know, they're very informal over there like that, and I'm not, I'm not saying we should do that. I think we should, we should just make that amendment, perhaps. And um, as Tracy's suggesting, I think they could distribute that workload a little bit better. And... Um, we won't be having to replace the candidates as, as, as often because if we have seven and, and, and a couple of them leave, it's hard. It really is hard to fill that particular position because it's it requires so much work. So is everybody good with that? Maybe we could do an article. Take a look at it. Sure. I'll look at. I'll look that up. And we'll talk about that. Sure. Okay. So, are we so how much zoning stuff do we have coming up in in the fall? I, I will double check, um, but I'm not sure that there's any zoning. You don't related. think there's any zoning articles? It's more of what 20. God, what year? I think it'll take another year like because the, the process that that they take, yeah. um, especially with the public hearings and the notices and all that stuff, I'd they'd be under a short, yeah. really, really timeline to get anything before October, the end of October. I mean, they could do it, but you it would have to be something that they've already been working on. Just uh, on, not on zoning, but on the CPA, I did send a memo to uh, Gary Ellis about uh, requesting if he could consider officially presenting to his committee uh, suspending action at this Springtown meeting to get in line for next fall mm -hmm. so that his, because they, they would have to manipulate their submission process so I've sent that memo I'm waiting to have a follow-up with Gary on that but I, that was our anticipation that there'd be about a delay of about six to eight months or so mm -hmm. in uh, CPA projects because we would make a skip in the spring so to, to line them up for next fall should we also be having a conversation with them sometime in the near future in terms of what our plans are for wastewater I think yeah. that I mean I know that they said they reached out to them too but yeah um, you know, if there's anything on those financial plans that we could take care of in the fall. Yeah, we do I have a plan to bring the boards together to have a discussion as to what we want to do because uh, doing anything with CPA is going to require a town meeting vote and a ballot question. Same thing with the uh, Wastewater Infrastructure Trust. So so that's all got to be dialogued out and get to some common ground on that. But we've, we've started to open that conversation with Gary and the committee, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, they, they're aware of the global problem, and Rich has been explaining that to them before they come in and talk to us. We're just here. Just kind of a random thing on the agenda. All right, so that was a great conversation. <laughs> Next. So we don't have any business. Short town meeting. Okay. Well, the only other one was in much norm. Would be the, uh, get ahead of the vote. Eric well, the article on, uh, on, the, on, that on the regional Eric agreement. The, the regional agreement. Sounds like Dennis yeah. has determined yeah. the date. So yeah. Yeah, a, and then the article no uh, for the agreement no on DHY would Absolutely. be part of that. That's all right. You only need that. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Oh, and then um, financing the DPW project. That was... The last piece of that that's the only piece really yep. all right so well, those agreement mean, languages if no one else Mike, fine. let me just ask one question yeah. and that it gets back to something Tracy was talk, talking about and that is is on on clean water wastewater is is there some action we should yes. be thinking about teeing up on so if related to the financing side I know the tenant yeah, if you sandwich took an action and created a wastewater investment fund if you could probably also address whether or not we want to set aside capital from the uh, the short-term rental tax so I'm not suggesting that we that's a policy though that doesn't even need to go to town meeting. That's a, I don't I don't think so no so I think we may need to create something for that the uh, wastewater infrastructure if you follow the sandwich model they took that to town meeting to establish the fund and divert the CPA last fall with the idea that they were going to line up for a ballot question because it needs a ballot question so th this is in the or actually they just did it in the spring at their springtown meeting so we wanted to follow the same model you you introduce the 
item to town meeting, see if you get an approval there with the idea that at a subsequent uh, election cycle, you'll put a ballot question on. It's kind of complicated, but that's that their approach seems to have uh, won over the day over there. So you create the fund? Yes. Yeah. At town meeting, but do you create do you do you create the funding source at the same time or just the fund? Well, so you so like if you wanted to reverse the CPA, what they they ended up doing a two percent for CPA and a two percent for WIP. Yeah. So that had to get a town meeting approval, then eventually get to a ballot question. Right. Yeah. Mike, can we just back up though? Dan has told us that October 29th is the date, and I don't know why that's acceptable to us if we have two members that can't be there. Who else can't be there? Eric and uh, Norm both can't be there. Oh, I didn't know that. I knew I knew Norm could. I didn't know Eric couldn't. So we should find. We should pitch another date. To All right. So we're going to have to talk to them, right, and t let them know that, and see what other date they can do it in. Right. Work out the logistics. We'll have to do the 22nd. Are you guys both available the week before? I could do it the week before. <laughs> sure. Okay, we'll put a question mark on that and see if we can do it. If we can do it on the 22nd, just lock it in. Okay. Because everybody can make that right. Okay. All right. Um, Definitely with the DPW facility, yeah. if that's even in oh, question. Absolutely. Yeah, because well, they're going to go out to bid by that time, and yeah. those bids are going to only be held for a certain period of time. Okay, so DPW. So just so that I understand, you're oh. suggesting that we don't what? do anything on wastewater no, investment. I'm no, I'm saying that we put it in front of to establish the fund. In the fall? In the fall, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll have a memo to you to okay. describe Good. the steps needed, but I, I think the sandwich way, which sandwich approach that... I agree. Is, was, I'm just trying to figure out step. what you wanted, yeah, whether yeah. you wanted yeah. to do it in the yeah. fall or not. I, I would agree with well, you. Well, I, I, I've been kind of hesitant, but I think we're picking up, we're picking up enough momentum now on this particular topic that we would be in good position all right. by the fall. So Dan's going to give us a memo, all right, kind of outlining how we could proceed in the fall meeting to create the fund on the sandwich model. We'll look at it. We'll take it up next meeting. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we'll talk about it again. All right. Does anybody have anything else on that? No. 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 Okay. Board and committee items, committee appointments. Um, the first item is a resignation from the assessing department, or the assessing, the board of assessors, excuse board me. Assessors, yeah. And that is, um, I, move, I would like, a, I'm recommending that we accept uh, with gratitude and appreciation the resignation of Stephanie Miller. So moved. Second. All in favor? Right. Aye. Any opposed? It carries. Thank you. There's another item, uh, but I don't think it was in your packet. Uh, we received word that Chris Lutazzi, Chris serves on the Conservation Commission, and Chris has resigned. So I'm recommending that we accept Chris's resignation. Don't they usually request that it be done in writing? I usually like it in writing, but I did get a memo. Usually, I have a memo from the conservation agent, but I thought something would be distributed to the rest of the board. I don't think you got it. Officially resigned. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so moved. Second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries. Thank you. Uh, the last item is with respect to the the Golf Enterprise Fund. Uh, you have a, a talent bank application in front of you from an applicant to serve on this committee. His name is Rich Simon. He has served um, on the Library Ad Hoc Study Committee for quite some time and uh, came before us uh, not too long ago as part of their presentation on the uh, library recommendations. He's, he stepped down for that and is uh, recommended for appointment as a regular member to the Yarmouth Golf Enterprise Committee for a three-year term which runs April 2022. Can I just ask a question on sure. this? Because um, was anybody from the Golf Enterprise Committee involved in this interview process or recommendation? Well, typically what we try to do with all the committees is engage them, but um, we did not get any expression of interest for them to participate in the interview process this time around. So. Um,
And that's not unusual. We've had other committees where they've chosen not to or not communicated that interest. Um, that's happened in the library committee before. There have been times where we've participated in interviews with candidates with them. We do that together. That's part of our process. We, we keep that opportunity open. In the past, we've actually done it on the, with the Golf Enterprise Committee. We've done stuff together jointly with them before in interviewing candidates, but that did not happen in this time. That's not because of my failure. It's because uh, th they did not express an interest. So Multiple candidates or just? We had three candidates. Oh, that you interviewed? And actually one candidate uh, made the... Um, he, in the interview, became interested in the Water Resources Advisory Committee. He's Mr. Perkins, who uh, has the Ph.D. in economics and was uh, sitting in the audience tonight. Okay, I just had some feedback from people on the Golf Enterprise Committee regarding this appointment. Yeah, I've generally had positive feedback, um, but I understand there may, you know, there, there, there may not be, but I don't have anything other than... Uh, the background on each of the candidates that applied. And we go through the basic criteria in terms of their application, the background. Uh, Mr. Simon has a, a background and in, in degree in process engineering. Again, he was appointed and served on a previous committee for the town, so, and he showed quite, quite a lot of capability serving on that committee. And uh, so. I met him uh, and uh, have actually, uh, I met with him personally at his home. To, uh, he uh, uh, sent an email talking about some of the uh, golf um, statistics. Uh, this was back about three months ago, I think. And uh, uh, as you may recall, he made a very um, thoughtful presentation uh, for the library uh, board and uh, he was really taking the same approach with regard to golf and, and had a lot of good data and information that he had developed individually uh, that would be of great use I think uh, uh, to the committee so yeah I appreciate that Norm I, the, the impression that I get just from my discussions with him is that he believes that the town um, should be principally responsible for managing the golf right. and believes that um, he there are ways to do that. Yep. And yeah, he believes having an engineering that. background and a find some financial background, um, he offered a fairly impressive presentation. Yep. So Yeah, I, I just to add that I, I play golf with Richard and he is as intelligent of a person as you will ever meet. Um, and you know, I think that um, he has a little bit of a different perspective on Yarmouth Golf as he was a former member and uh, left yeah. due to um, what I gather as his, his uh, being treated uh, unfairly by a prior administration. So I think that's a, that's a perfect person um, the perfect type of person to have on a committee like that because it offers a much different perspective than you may already have there. And I have no doubt that uh, he will be a uh, valuable addition to that committee. I appreciate I, that. I know I spoke to him about the, um, uh, the Enterprise Committee, and I, I've forgotten when this was, and, and he was very, you know, he said, well, he said, I'm, I'm uh, concerned they might react to some of the information that I might have. And it is, uh, he was sensitive to, uh, you know, the fact that they, uh, he might ruffle some feathers. And But, uh, you yeah, know. Well, I was very impressed with his work on the, with, the, with the library yeah. committee. Very thorough, very analytical, very detailed. Um, he handled the questions that we threw at him quite well. So um, I thought his performance on that committee was outstanding. And um, based on the interviews, he was the top candidate. I move we nominate him. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It carries. And that in concludes my report. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark. We have approval of minutes January 8th, 19, and February 12th, 19. So moved. We have a second. All right. Motion, second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. They're approved. We're getting closer. Upcoming agenda <laughs> review. Mark, you want to talk about that wastewater item I mentioned earlier? Um, yeah, uh, just I'll, I'll be as I'll be brief. Um, I'll do everything I can to be brief. 
Um, what I had suggested to Mike is my concern about with clean water, wastewater being such a large topic, if there are ways to break it down into discernible chunks. I, I think I'm very concerned about information overload in any one meeting, and so if there was a way, for example, like tonight, the cost recovery plan. Let's just focus on, on that. How are we looking at that? I suggested also that um, we focus on at a select board meeting soon on just the, the agreement, the Tritown agreement, just to have a focused discussion on that agreement. It's part of it. Um, and so having a very focused discussion on what's in the proposed agreement, what changes were made to it, why they were made, how it affects the whole sort of um, picture of uh, wastewater in Yarmouth. It, I mean, I think we can have that discussion and probably that could be a 30 minute 45 at the most uh, agenda item topic. Uh, another topic would be focusing on some of the design aspects of the, 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 the treatment plan itself. Um, I do believe that the discharge locations uh, will involve some disruption, some changes, so I think we need to get Rich and Jeff, the engineer, maybe even the Water Resources Advisory Committee to come in and update the board on the Tritown treatment plant design, particularly discharge, because we're looking at potentially some disruptor, disruptions at the, uh, the Bass River Golf Course. And I think if golf has been on our agenda and the finances of golf, I think we need to have, we need to be briefed on what those impacts might be, what those issues might be, and what the implications could be in terms of that facility. Um, I was briefed on it briefly at the last DHY committee meeting. I, I think it's a topic that warrants some intense discussion from this board. Um, so that we're briefed on just what it is they're contemplating and what it is they're thinking because I think there are ramifications across the board. So that's an item. Um, I, th I think at, at another meeting, a focused discussion on the Bonstable option. Where are we? What is it? What are the possibilities there? Again, that doesn't require a lot of time, but if we had a focused discussion on that, I think that would be helpful. Um, I also think at some point, Tracy, that the Clean Water Trust Fund is going to come up with some recommendations with respect to how to disperse monies. So at the appropriate time when they come up with recommendations, it might be helpful to have a board briefing and update on that, you know, with you. I missed the first meeting. The second meeting went to was all around uh, DOT, uh, Department of Revenue. There was a speaker there from Department of Revenue in the process of collect, basically collecting right. and how it goes. And that's that's that was the whole meeting. Right. And then the finally is just the, the phase one plan itself, the plan itself going into a little bit more detail on that. I, I don't think that takes a lot of time. We kind of gloss over it and go over it, but at some point we're going to have to start connecting the dots on exactly what that looks like, how this other short-term work fits in. And, um, and I also believe that with respect to the overall phase one plan, one of the questions that the voters are going to be asking for, and that's why it's good to have these public meetings now, is because we can begin to figure out what where the community is at on this. The, one of the comments that I keep hearing about is innovation. Other towns are doing things using more innovative really approaches, and I'd like to, to sort of brief or be briefed on this topic from from the Water Resources Advisory Committee and our our staff and in our team, um, because as Rich said tonight that. Yes, there are innovative approaches, but there's some implications, because I believe this is the question that we're going to get asked as select board members. People in the community might say, listen, in the town of Mashpee, they're, they're planning on reducing nutrients significantly through shellfish aquaculture. Um, I believe that's a question. I think we need to know to what degree that's an option here or not. I think there are, mother there are other aspects of innovation uh, that we need to at least have some public discussion and awareness of because unless there's some discussion of it, um, I believe uh, it could come back to, to be a real problem. So I'm not suggesting that these be the topics. I'm, I'm not suggesting that these be the individual items. All I'm suggesting is that it would be helpful to break the overall topic of clean water into discernible chunks. Um, I would leave, you know, I sent this memo to Mike and I sent it to Dan. I'm, I'm happy with them working out a way to lay it out for us in a sequence. Um, but what, I, what I'm afraid of is as we approach decision-making time that, you know, we end up having 
these ex incredibly long discussions covering just about every aspect of, of this. And then by the time we start thinking about making decisions or recommendations, it's a, sort of an exhausting affair. Mm -hmm. so, so those are my suggestions, and um, I just sort of lay them out there. I don't know if you want people to comment on it, Mike, or if you, uh, how you want. And more if they want to comment. Yeah. Norm, do you have any comments on that? No, I think it's fine. Makes uh, sense you know, to it me. Sounds, sounds like there, there may be a few other topics that could be combined. Yeah. Uh, that, Probably. Uh, you know, because otherwise you get uh, like seven different topics spread over yeah. uh, quite a few meetings. So you might want to, you know, think about that. You okay. Know, and, uh, yeah. But I, uh, but I think it is a good idea generally, and I and I think the uh, the continuous exposure and discussion with regard to wastewater, I think, is is healthy mm -hmm. at this point. So. All right, Tracy or uh, Eric, do you have any comments on that? No, I uh, prefer smaller bites of the apple. Yeah, me too. We'll, right. we'll, we'll, we'll work uh, out uh, some <laughs> topics and maybe combine some of those smaller things into a little bit meatier uh, presentations. All right, so we're going back. Next meeting's the 13th. Does anybody have anything they want to put on or comment on? We have special entertainment license for High Watch Recovery Center, Yarmouth Permitting Guide presentation. Mr. Chairman, if I might, the yeah. permitting guide presentation yes. probably be moved to September due to uh, staff vacations. It's going to move to September? Yeah. I know that wasn't what is, what's permitting the guide. The Yarmouth Permitting Guide is going to be moved to September. Okay. Can we have the uh, opioid litigation update, substance abuse action, plan presentation, veterans beach sticker policy? Committee handbook discussion, um, which is ongoing from prior meetings. Fiscal year 20 Board of Selectmen goals review, which is continued. And that's it. Great. Anybody have anything else they want to put on there or something to put on a placeholder for future meetings? Uh, what point is there going to be a follow-up meeting with the golf membership to update on the year-end yep. results? I, uh, the, um, we don't have a date yet for that. I did meet with National Golf Consultants yesterday, uh, so they're underway now. They're going to be going for the week here. Uh, I have a wrap-up meeting with them, I think, on Thursday afternoon. So that's uh, early August. So we probably would be in position um, to kind of share with them what the results are to date, maybe for the August Enterprise meeting. I'll have to work with Scott to, uh, to uh, schedule something for that. Okay. Try to make that all work out. I'm a little off uh, schedule because of the events of the last yeah. week. So I'm <laughs> trying to play catch up here in my head on all this okay. stuff. So. I figured that's why it was here. I need a break then. We'll get that done. All right. You ready to move on to individual items? Norm, you have anything? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, the follow-up on, on Center Street, um, there, there had been discussion, and I know Ruth, who had uh, uh, started talking um, uh, back and forth with the chief uh, was about to get into the discussion about speed bumps. I've seen those in other communities in Connecticut uh, being used very effectively. And they're, they're not permanent, they're temporary. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile trying to test someplace in our community. Uh, you know, so I know you had had some experience them. with them, Dan, yeah. and uh, you know, or why we would have any opposition to that. You know, I think uh, there's a section within the population down there that would like to trial it, and I did propose at that meeting to trial one. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly think that if we present some options like that to you as a temporary, mm -hmm. what I'd like to be able to do is I, I'd want to have your endorsement of tr doing a trial mm -hmm. to before we launch something like that and have a couple of try to re-engage the neighborhood briefly before we do that. So that's certainly something we could take a look at for sure. Um, and also just, uh, you know, I've had some conversation, Dan, with you about a recent incident with uh, in, in golf, and I had 
reported to you that I had a, uh, you know, someone comment to me about a, a staff member parking in a, mm -hmm. in a spot that was bag drop. I had seen it like three re weeks running. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I transferred the message to you, you late relayed it, and the next two days later, I got hit by that person saying, why did you uh, uh, bring up this issue? And she confronted me in front of other customers. And I gotta tell you, if I was a member, just a member, I'd say, take your membership, shove it. Because that, that was how difficult that conversation was. I, you know, Norm, to be honest with you, I have to look into that. I don't yeah. even know the details. I just, I just yeah, uh, understood. You know, I, yep. it was, uh, I was just astounded that the, the person would bring that up uh, in front of other members and would confront me, push mm -hmm. back, and say, gee, I hope as a selectman you've, you've uh, gone to all the other departments and made sure there, that no other employee is parking in the wrong spot. You've got to be kidding me. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know it, after all we've said about customer service. Yeah, understood. Service. That's mm -hmm. uh, like uh, you have to get down to the bottom of that one. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> I appreciate that. Tracy? No, I just, um, we've already said it. Uh, thanks to everybody. Um, not only for um, the, the tornado response from our first responders, but also to um, everybody on this board, um, especially Mike and Norm, who has worked uh, additionally with um, trying to resolve the, the school issues. So I appreciate all the time that is, that's put in. Eric? I have nothing. No. Thank you for it. I'm all set. Um, I w I'd just like to thank everybody that was involved, all the town staff, um, particularly the D DPW people, for um, all their hard work in clearing out the roads and um, processing all these massive amounts of debris. Um, I think that snow is a lot easier to move than hardwood and um, yeah. you know they've recently been recognized as first responders and a, a, an event like this kind of emphasizes why because nothing else moves without those guys they come in they open roads and without that there's really um, everybody's pretty much immobilized until until those operations get into effect and, and, and my thanks too to the state to the governor lieutenant governor and all the um the undersecretary of um holding on security and all the others that um provided service um to our community um without which uh we'd still be digging out you know in, in a serious measure right now so thank you to everybody I went by that same neighborhood we we had explored oh. with the governor on Thursday on Sun, on Sunday and um, it's still in shambles but significant progress in terms of opening the roadway had been done and um, you know honestly it brought me to tears there was a gentleman on the corner and trees everywhere he was sitting on his step he had a towel around his neck and he just looked yep. so defeated mm. and I I looked over and it just took me it was uh yeah really what day did the governor come here wednesday was it wednesday uh, and thursday wednesday and thursday so wednesday i think we were thursday we were out there sunday is when i went by to look yeah. at the progress and the road was was cleared at that point in time but um the day after the governor came that that next day no uh, thursday you could they just we had an army of people here to send on yarmouth i mean the response was very very one of the things that was impressive in that meeting, he had no notes or anything like that. And after everybody gets done talking, he goes, there's five things that I see that people need. One, two, three, four, five. And this is how we're going to implement it. And you could tell he had been through that. And one of the things he said to me when I was thanking him, he said, one thing you get pretty good at when you're the governor, and he said, that's seeing disasters. Yes, it wasn't sir. the first time, and uh, you could tell he was highly experienced with this kind of catastrophe, and 
and uh, I mean, he he made he made things move very very quickly. Within 24 hours, I mean, there was there were tons of help coming down. And one thing people should know too, they hear the Department of Corrections, they think that you know they open the jails and let everybody down here. <laughs> there were some inmates, but the vast majority of those workers were people that were uh, were cadets. trainees in the Department of Corrections. Uh, so there were uh, a lot of people who saw those buses that thought they were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. No, in the brown uniforms. So. Yeah, yeah. No, they were cadets. But there were there were some inmates from Concord, I think it was, but. Most of those, I think there was like 80 something of them, but there were like 200 and something uh, trainees from the from the Department of Corrections. That and again, um, Dan was Dan was one of the more vocal um, presences um, at that initial at that initial meeting because he had been through this before, um, and you could tell that he and the governor had a certain dialogue going because they're both experienced in these kind of events. So that was. That was um, important. Just to let you know, Mike, uh, Secretary Turco was uh, instrumental in all that DOC presence. He's the Department of Public Safety Secretary. He's going to be in town to meet with Jeff, myself, Frank, and Phil tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And um, I'm interested to hear uh, his take on things. But one of the things, to your point, the governor, as soon as he left town, he got in the, the, the vehicles heading back to Boston, called everybody up on a conference call. And Secretary Terco was the one that had all that effort to bear along with the National Guard. And that's pretty rare to see so much of a turnout from DOC like that. So so that's a lot of good credit, good good participation from them. DCR was and, very yeah. Yeah, well, they're well. used to, DCR yeah, is used to that stuff all and all that, yeah. I've never seen them respond. But the, but, but the biggest I'm thing with, with the DOC folks was yeah. the manpower, just the labor, the hands on the street, Dude. foot on the street. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have you know, moved as much debris as we did without oh. that effort, yeah. So so he'll be in town tomorrow to well, talk a little bit about us, that. Please. Absolutely. And they, and they availed them, uh, us of um, heavy equipment, too. Jeff Colby was pointing out some, some big pieces of equipment that the state had brought down to, to the DPW facility. So it was, uh, it, it was a great effort. One partner that is missed often in this stuff, I can't mention enough. I've been here long enough to, to see them firsthand in action is uh, Sean O'Brien from the county. Uh, he's the one that's in charge of uh, the emergency. emergency management effort, okay. props up the uh, call center, what's referred to as the multi-agency coordinating center, the MAC, gets us all moving in the right direction, gets all the assets that we need from all the different state entities onto that phone line. And once that first call goes up, uh, you begin to see the elements of the plan coming together. So Sean is uh, one of the unsung heroes of Cape Cod as it relates because you don't see him a lot, but with every time there's an event of magnitude, he's on the phone putting us all together in the same, same thought process going in the same direction. So I'd have to say thank you to Sean and his team. Okay, Con uh, consent agenda. What do we have on the consent uh, we agenda? We have a pretty robust set of donations, $2,600 in total. Um, so that's uh, yeah, most of which Second. is uh, yeah, we don't need the boardwalk. Yeah. So. Okay, we have a motion and second on that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Town administrator updates. I'm all set. Okay, well set there. Water resource planning, you don't have anything there, right? No. Nope. The schools we did, Manakee school projects not applicable, Cape Tech. Anything on Cape Tech? No, just uh, okay, in the D DPW on. facility. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We are adjourned. Aye.